Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, meeting of Working and Borough Council's Planning Committee. Uh, my name is Callum Wynham. I'll be clerking the meeting this evening. As this is the first meeting of the municipal year, uh, we need to elect a chairman amongst our members. So I'm going to ask if there are any nominations for chairman. Yes, Stephen. And do you have a seconder? It's Andrew. And then are there any other nominations for chairman? No, can I just see a, a show of hands for members uh, in favour of Rochelle being chairman? That's one, two, three, four, five. Uh, any against? And any abstentions? Two. OK, thank you very much. I will now hand over to Rochelle to chair the remainder of the meeting. Rod, could you please turn your camera off until you're ready to speak? Rod, would you please turn off your camera? Thank you. I want to nominate the chair, vice chair. So yeah, you need to move on to oh, so you need to ask for nominations. <laughs> Sorry about this. First time doing the planning committee, so as the chair. Uh, are there any nominations for vice chair? I'd like to nominate Andrew Mickleborough. And seconds, Stephen. Uh, now voting. Voting for. Against. Against. Abstentions. Any apologies, please? Uh, yes, thanks, Chair. Uh, apologies received from councillors Wayne Smith and Rebecca Margetts. OK, welcome to this evening's meeting of the Planning Committee of Woking Borough Council on the. Sorry, I have to look at the date, the 8th of June. Uh, this meeting is being held as a hybrid meeting with the committee members present in the room this evening, whilst some officers Rebecca are Margaret. attending the meeting in person and some are connecting via Microsoft Teams. The meeting is being live streamed on YouTube. My name is Councillor Rochelle Shepherd Bay, just in case I didn't realize who I was. And I will chair the meeting. Uh, Andrew Mickler is our vice chair. The planning com committee consists of nine elected borough councillors who are supported by a variety of professional officers. We, Stephen Conway. David Cornish, Gary Cowan, Andrew Mickleborough, myself, Chris Bowring, and John Kaiser. This is a quasi judicial committee with formal set procedures which must be adhered to. Firstly, the planning officer will present the application, and then only those registered speakers who are registered to speak will be invited to address the committee. No one else, including borough councils, town or parish councils, agents, applicants, objectors, supporters, are permitted to address the committee, ask questions, or disrupt the meeting. Everyone has had the opportunity to comment on each application through the consultation process. Please note that there is a strict time limit of three minutes per category speaker, those being town and parish councils, objectors, supporters, and those borough me members affected by the application. Members of the committee are more impressed by the quality of what you say rather than how long you speak for. But above all, please stay within your time limit. 
Following the registered speakers, members of the committee will discuss and debate each application and seek clarification from the council's professional planning officers in order to try and reach a decision. The decision is reached by the committee may or may not agree with that recommended by the presenting case officer. Finally, it is the committee's responsibility to determine any valid planning application presented before it using current national and planning policies and relevant decisions of the relevant planning inspectorate. Our role is not to suggest alternatives to the applications, nor to consider whether they're a good idea, whether they're needed, whether they're too costly, or whether there are alternative uses of the site or more suitable use of the land elsewhere. If you are joining us remotely, please ensure your camera is switched on only when you're speaking and that your microphone is unmuted only when you are speaking. Thank you. And the minutes of the meeting, I'm being reminded to use the microphone as well. Are members happy with the meeting minutes? Show of hands. Yeah. Show of hands. Do you approve them? It's carried. Carried. Any declarations of interest? I will say that I will not be speaking and not taking any. I will not doing anything. I will leave the room for the application uh, number 2208259 the terrorist because I have been speaking with um, the person who had originally listed the application and I feel that it's ethically questionable whether I should join in the conversation at that point. Thank you. Any applications to be deferred or withdrawn? Uh, yes, Chair. Uh, item numbers 11, 12, and 13, that's application 220359, 220321, and 220332 have been withdrawn from the agenda. And the first application is on page 25. It's the application of number 2211508, Rosa Building. Mulberry Business Park, Fish Ponds Road, Wokingham. Would anybody like to speak? Mark, would you like to speak? Yes, thank you, Chairman. I'll just give a very brief presentation. Um, so this is the application site outlined in red here, and you can see the building there. Um, Fish ponds raises to the north, and uh, you can just see the access where the cursor is there. And Oaklands Park is to the west. You've got Ilex building to the south, and Indigo House to the east. Um, this is just an aerial photo to show the site in a bit more context. Uh, these are the existing elevations. You can see it's a two-story uh, building with a shallow pitched roof. This is the proposed uh, the proposed elevations, just showing the additional story going on the top here with a similar proportioned roof. And these are the side elevations. You can just see the greyed out building here is actually Ilex House, um, which has been put on the plans. So you can just see the scale of what's being proposed is in keeping with what's been allowed um, just to the south of the application site. Uh, these are the floor plans. A uh, breakdown of uh, the flats and the sizes are in the officers are in the officers report. Uh, this is just a photo from uh, Fishponds Road, just showing you the main axis here. And you can see Rosa Building is the structure there with the purple fenestration and the scaffold in there is uh, from Ilex House. Again, these are just some photos from Fishponds Road showing the building. And here's a photo from Oaklands Park, which is the west elevation. You can just see the scaffolding as well to Ilex House to the right. And this is looking back northwards, so you can just see the axis onto Fish Ponds Road where the cursor is. So you've got Rosa Building here in the middle with the purple fenestration, uh, Indigo House to the right, and Ilex House uh, just to the left there. And these are just two faces just showing uh, the Rosa Building with, and you can just sort of see the general sort of car parking and landscaping. Um, so to conclude, Chairman, uh, the application is recommended for approval for the reasons set out in the officer's report, and that's subject as well to the conditions and legal agreements set out in the report. Um, and I'll be happy to answer any further questions. Thank you. Just pass the screen back. No public speakers. There's no public speakers, so. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, I don't have any any particular objection to this application. Um, I think in planning terms, 
effectively the principle has already been established by the prior approval applications um, in design terms it seems acceptable um, the room sizes which were a concern i think of of the town council seem to all comply uh, with with standards uh, but i do have a question mark if i may um, in your summary uh, on page 25 and in the uh, recommendation uh, A relating to the uh, legal agreement, you refer to um, an affordable housing contribution might be delivered depending upon the profitability of the development and whether that makes it viable. Um, can I just ask who would determine the profitability threshold? Um, it would be a mixture of the council, the applicant, and we've gone to an independent uh, consultee called Kemps and Carcroft to deal with this regularly, so it'd be in consultation with them. I don't have a figure for you now what that would be, um, but it'd be in negotiation with sort of those three parties to, um, to come to a suitable agreement, which we felt was fair, um, but also, um, you know, if it was possible, clawed back affordable housing for the council. Thank you. So, so there is an independent element involved in that? Because yes, so they submitted a viability review, which um, is an independent specialist on their behalf. Then we've instructed Kemps and Carcroft on our behalf, which have looked at it initially. And then what they'll do um, is look at uh, a final open book report to see whether it's profitable. And we'll speak to Kemps and, Car Kemps and Carcroft as well regarding the legal agreement to see what proportion we feel of profits should go towards affordable housing. Okay, thank you. Andrew and then Gary. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I too was uh, going to ask a question about um, how the affordable housing contribution would be considered um, at a later date stage. Uh, so thank you, Mark, for clarifying that. I do have one other question, uh, and that is about um, parking. Um, the existing parking of 53 spaces will remain unchanged an oversupply of eight spaces. Um, the existing um, use of the, um, uh, the two uh, floors of this building will remain as is. Um, presumably, there are currently a large number of vacant spaces on site at most times of the day, enough to accommodate the additional vehicles that we might expect you know, with these um, um, additional um, uh, flats. But my question is um, really whether or not we might wish to consider informative, uh, regardless of whether there will be more than sufficient spaces, it might help to avoid potential future conflicts if a sufficient number of spaces were allocated to the flats. It's the old horny debate that we've discussed before about allocated versus unallocated um, parking. So I'm just wondering whether um, uh, this is something that members might wish to consider as an informative. Um, just to draw your attention, uh, Councillor, to condition number five, which sets out that the parking details um, need to be provided in, in accordance to the approved plan. So if there is any change um, in what they plan to do, um, that can be caught by condition five. However, um, I don't have a, I don't oppose an informative if you say you wish uh, to put that up. Gary? Yeah, thank you. Um, just a few observations. I think uh, planning uh, planning regulations dictate that we 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 approve this. Um, national described space standards. I mean, how do they? I'm sure we do have a residential design of our own space standards in it. How does that compare with the national space standards? Are ours higher or lower? Um, now, that's the first question. The other one is, what I don't understand is that it's on a, on unviable to provide affordable housing and an external third party consultant has con co confirmed this if in our core strategy we 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 talk of the provision of affordable housing in all developments does it mean that anybody who can put a development in and make a viability case that we could go and give them planning permission and no affordable housing are provided i think it's a question that needs to be answered um the other issue is um the whole principle of this uh, development, uh, redevelopment of um, business 
units is that is that if each individual unit came forward as a planning application on on a green space, shall we say, there would be a requirement for public open space and all sorts of additional facilities. But what's happening here is that building by building by building um, is being converted into re residential development and there's no provision of any any facilities. And in, in this area around Molly Millers, I think there's probably a, a thousand units so far. And if we tried to build a thousand units, we would have to provide a lot of infrastructure and open space, public transport, et cetera, et cetera. In these sort of scenarios, we don't. So the, really, so the, the two main questions are, is um, uh, compliance with our residential design guide standards? And um, uh, should we really be given planning permission to applications that are not providing any viable um, affordable housing? If it's not viable, the planning application shouldn't be granted, I think. Anyway, we should. So to answer your first question, Councillor, our space standards, uh, we do have separate space standards. They're very similar to the national standards. Um, the council adopted its standards before the national described space standards came into effect. Council standards are slightly more generous, um, but it's very marginal. Um, however, I think appeal inspectors have been um, fairly well. They've been utterly consistent in terms of how they apply space standards, and it would be the national standards. And I, I don't think we'd have any sort of standing to request that they would be larger. Um, with regard to um, affordable housing, it, it's worth remembering that viability is actually written into the policy. It's written into our development plan policy. CP5 and it's also written into the MPPF. So if an applicant can't provide affordable housing because it's unviable and they can demonstrate that, then it's policy compliance still. It, it's it's baked into the policy with that regard. Um, to answer your final question about um, facilities and services and the sort of incremental effect, just to remind you that um, they will have to pay SIL uh, for those 11 units and we do have one of the highest SIL charges in the country. So. Um, there would still be money being delivered from this uh, from this scheme, which would go towards facilities and services as part of SEAL. Stephen. Um, thank you, Chair. I, I'm very happy to second Andrew's proposal that we add a, an informative, encouraging the applicant to consider allocated car parking spaces. Um, I, I do. I have a lot of sympathy with everything Gary said. But I, I fear you know, this is one of those applications because it's based on prior approval applications over which we have remarkably little control. Um, and our, our hands are, are pretty well tied. So I think we just have to uh, accept there's probably not much we can do in this instance. OK, John. Um, can you just tell me how much the seal is? I, I see it's got a, a rate per square metre, but how much is it exactly? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. I could do a quick back of fag packet um, calculation, but um, with regard to the details in the officer report in terms of square meterage, um, but I don't have it off the top of my head and it would take me probably a couple of minutes to look at that. Um, do you need? Do you what? Do you want that uh, information now? Because yes, I won't if, you, be, if you can do it, yes. I won't be able to provide it initially. I'll need to sort of turn off my camera and get a calculator out. Okay. Well, if you if you can't do it tonight, then maybe you could send it to members of the committee. Yep, I'm more than happy to do that. Okay. The other question I need is to answer, um, is regards to fire. Uh, are they going to fit sprinklers into these? This is in a fairly high risk area. It's in the middle of a trading estate. We've just had a very, very expensive and dangerous fire in my ward with a block of flats. Do you know whether there's any additional fire safety over and above what, what's normally expected? I don't. And the sort of short and blunt answer would be it's not a material consideration because it's called by building regulations. Thank you. Has the fire authority made any comments about that? 
Uh, they haven't, no. Um, from experience, the fire authority generally comment on things like what the siting of water hydrants rather than the actual detail of the internal layouts. That would, like I say, that would be a, a matter for building regulations. OK, can we have a vote please on the informative first of all? The informative consists of it's desirable to include allocated parking spaces for the flats. All those in favor? It's unanimous. And a vote on the application. Those in favor? Sorry. That's unanimous again. We have received a letter from Matt Rada, MP. Uh, I'm only reading this out because the public can't hear, can't read it uh, in YouTube, and also the rest of the people haven't heard it either. Um, it says, "Dear Clyde, I'm writing to ask the council to delay, delay making a decision on plans to demolish the AdWest building in Woodley, and the council takes the necessary time to consider how to protect this important historic building and also to reduce noise and air pollution for residents who live near the site." As you know, this is an important Art Deco building, was the Miles Aircraft Factory and played a central part in Woodley's aviation history and a large number of residents have called for the building to be saved for the community. At the same time, there are, there are already serious issues with noise and air quality for the residents near the site. These are caused by existing HGV traffic and the plans to replace the AdWest building with logistics hub seems particularly inappropriate as they are likely to exasperate some of these serious problems. I hope you'll be able to look at this issue and consider the view of the residents and, and himself as the local MP. And over to Graham. Uh, thank you, Chair. The site is Headley Park, Headley Road East in Woodley, and the scheme is for the proposed erection of five buildings for commercial development to provide flexible light industrial, general industrial and storage and distribution uses with ancillary offices. The site is between Headley Road East and Viscount Way. It is within the Headley Road East industrial area, which is designated as a core employment area in the development plan and approximately indicated by the yellow line you can see. The site itself is indicated by the red line. The scheme involves demolition of the buildings on the site and the erection of 10 units provided across five buildings. On the opposite side of Viscount Way, two buildings are proposed with parking and landscaping along the boundary. The application was deferred from the previous committee meeting due to members wanting to better understand the site context and visit the site. Members visited the site on Monday 6th of June and walked the surrounding roads in the site itself and had a look inside the office building. The report presented to members tonight provides clarification on the topics that were deferred. However, the previous officer report and minutes of the meeting are appended. There are some minor points of clarification provided in the supplementary agenda, but have noticed an additional condition which secures the access of the site by HGVs to and from Headley Road East only. Beyond this, however, the recommendation remains the same, which is for conditional approval. As mentioned by the chair, uh, there was a letter received from Matt Rodder MP and an email response from the leader of the council, Clive Jones. In response, officers would like to clarify the scheme does not seek permission specifically for a logistics hub. It seeks a redevelopment of the site to provide mixed use units within the light industrial, general industri industry and storage and distribution use classes. No objection is raised from the council's highways officer in regard to the proposed HGV movements. In addition, the heritage aspects have been fully considered as set out in the reports. Therefore, officers do not consider that there are any planning reasons on which to defer determination of the application. Thank you, Chair. OK, we have a number of speakers for this particular presentation. Uh, the first speaker is going to be uh, Shirley Voigt. No, actually, the agent will be the first speaker. No, no, no it's nice. It's Keith Baker. Okay. 
Keith Baker will be the first speaker. I'm being told three different directions from two different directions. So. Right, uh, good evening and thank you for allowing me to address the committee again. Now, officers have often repeated that you cannot rectify existing problems and must concentrate on what is going on within the red lines. They are, of course, correct, but up to a point. That point is you need to consider the cumulative impact of this application on the immediate area. To date, I have not seen a single response from an officer acknowledging that fact. Now, the environmental impact will be based on multiple things, but one is significantly more impactful than the others. And I refer to the movement of HGVs on the site. Unfortunately, in the supplementary information provided tonight, it only states an increase of three HGVs per hour. It provides no background information to justify that, as, uh, that assertion. What is the movement of HGVs on the current site, for example? The, so can I refer you to this picture I, you, that should have been distributed to you? That's an aerial view of the site today. And roughly in the middle, uh, where you've got that block and that block, you'll see a little lane going down. OK, I'll draw your attention to that lane. So. You will notice that the access for the HGV is, in fact, in that very small, narrow strip of land to the left hand side. There are other much smaller access points, but this is the main one. Because this is small, it then necessarily restricts the number of HGVs that can actually access the site today. And remember, this is going likely to be the base point for the assertion of three extra HGVs per hour. So if it's already constrained, that is an artificially low base point. Now, the second point, which clearly follows on here, is that there is practically only one company operating on this site. And the restricted access tends to suggest the nature of their work meant that they probably do not need many HGV movements. They are related, the nature of the work and the HGV uh, movements. In contrast, the proposal now has 10 new units, each with their own HGV parking slots, many with three of them. So let's come back to the assertion of three extra HGV movements per hour. Again, assumptions have had to be made to make this calculation but this has not been made public. The volume of HGV improvements will be dictated by who actually leases each of those units. Some companies will have significantly more demand for HGV movements than others. So what assumption on the type of operation on these 10 units were made? Okay, can I just one sentence? So we have a new coalition led planning committee here. So please show that you care about Woodley and refuse this application. Thank you. The next person to speak is Kai Mead. And Julian, they're sharing their time. And Julian, and Julian Temple, you're sharing your time. You have three minutes total between the two of you. Thank you. Uh, I'll start by re uh, referring to last night's addition to the agenda uh, regarding a letter from uh, a Lily May Court resident. Uh, which you've been asked to disregard as it's not considered as being a material or immaterial to the application, which can only seek to resolve impacts caused by the proposed development. This is kind of judicially incorrect. One of the core MPPF objectives is to make sure planning decisions are made to ensure that new development is appropriate for its location, taking into account the likely effects, including cumulative effects uh, of pollution on health. The committee is being asked to consider this application under the caveat that the, develop, the development is not new. In reality, the development has a much larger industrial footprint with the addition of large scale buildings into areas that have no existing buildings whatsoever. Uh, it cannot be considered as redevelopment of existing uses because it's not. Uh, with a development of this nature, any adverse impacts upon local residents becomes a legal matter and legislative considerations. Uh, the fact that the Planning and Environmental Health Officers 
um, are in support of this development and are fully aware that more suffering and harm will come of it is beyond belief. Uh, it's stated that the scheme would result on average in an increase of three HGV movements per hour. So let me put this into context. This is a large industrial and distribution estate. It's going to have 20 individual HGV loading bays, yet there will only be an extra three HGV movements per hour. Uh, you're asked by Councillor uh, Cowan and other members at the last meeting to provide a thorough and detailed reassessment of your modelling to ensure we could clearly see the real outcome of this development and this is what you've come up with. Uh, Planning and Environmental Health have said that the applicant has agreed to ensure HGVs only access the site from Headley Road East, uh, save for the short section of Viscount Way needed to access uh, Units 9 and 10. Uh, the impact assessment report uh, states that there is going to be an adverse impact by day and a significant adverse impact at night, and this arises due to Units 9 and 10. Uh, I don't understand how this application be, can be approved. It's hurting people. Thank you. You've got just under a minute, so you okay. need to speak quickly, I'm afraid. OK, my comments are made on behalf of local residents and subject specific experts within Aviation Heritage UK and the wider Miles aircraft community. I have over 40 years of experience with heritage aviation buildings. Having done consultancy work for Historic England, I also know that their own specialist knowledge of such subjects is limited. My own site visit last week found much more original fabric surviving inside the main offices than has been reported, suggesting the historic England inspectors and others' unfamiliarity with buildings of this type. As a non-designated heritage asset, the offices are inherently locally important, and how far later use and the loss of the airfield setting diminish their significance is debatable. The building's exterior is relatively unaltered. It is easy to imagine it's in aviation use, especially with the context of local airfield-related road names. The public benefits claim do not seem to be exclusive to the scheme and could conceivably be met by one retaining the NDHA. That weakens both the weight attributed could to these benefits. Sum up, please? Sorry? Could you please sum up? OK. Uh, I'm therefore very disappointed to see nothing noticeably new on the heritage issues in the planning officer's report. I also expected a longer deferral to properly address the heritage issues raised. Thank you. And the next speaker will be Andy Riley, the agent. He's on Teams. And you're on Teams? Good evening. I'd like to reiterate several points about the scheme. The site is within a core employment area where the intensification of employment use is required by policy. The determination of any application must be based on the development within the red line boundary and cannot be used to fix existing problems which exist outside that boundary on land beyond the applicant's control. The cumulative impact issue raised at the previous committee can only be material if the scheme was for the new develop employment development, not redevelopment of an existing employment site as proposed. With regards to air quality, the uncontrolled current heavy industrial use is more harmful than proposed warehousing light industrial use. The neighbouring residents would have been aware they were moving next to an industrialist site. HGVs to the adjacent industrial site pass within three metres of Lily May Court, whereas there will be no HGV movements from the proposed development closer than 63 metres from the building. The proposal will not exacerbate existing levels of particulates, which are encased at low levels, as identified in the TRL report commissioned by the Council. As such, there would be no decrease in the air quality, and any harmful noise impacts can be effectively mitigated. The site has been fully assessed by Historic England and Secretary of State. The site is not statutory or locally listed. The site is not within a conservation area or area of special character. It is acknowledged the site is of local interest due to its former use as part of the Woodley Airfield. As such, it is regarded as a non-heritage asset where a balanced planning judgment is required. In assessing this balance, the significance and site context are important. However, little historic fabric remains. There is no understanding or experience that aircraft manufacture or repair occurred there. The airfield has long gone. The buildings have been significantly altered and used for non-aviation commercial uses for a considerable period. The benefits of the scheme, however, include the following. Between 222 and 433 new jobs, both skilled and unskilled, in addition to the existing occupier remaining within Wokingham, relocating to Sutton's Business Park. No HGVs arriving or departing along Viscount Way, removing 20 existing HGV movements per day from this road circa 2,700 square metres of additional commercial floor space 
in modern efficiency, energy efficient buildings. Significantly increased separation distances from homes on the eastern side by at least seven and a half metres with enhanced landscaping, reduced noise from the current use through improved design and orientation of buildings, 100 trees being planted, new wild, wildlife habitats created, a contribution to the Council's Employment Skills Programme, and the applicant is also willing to provide a small memorial or plaque at the front of the site to recognise the previous use of the site. The applicant therefore agrees with your officer's views that the balanced judgment weighs heavily in favour of the acceptability of the scheme as proposed and is in accordance with national and local planning policy. Accordingly, I respect, respectfully urge members to approve this application as recommended. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next speaker is Shirley Boyd, board member. Thank you. I'm disappointed that while some of the concerns expressed by members and residents at the last meeting have been listened to, others have simply been discounted or ignored. Regarding the Miles Aircraft HQ building, I do not see anything new in the report regarding the building. At the last meeting, members asked whether the facade could be maintained and incorporated into the scheme. What steps have been taken to assess the viability of this? Has the borough's building conservation officer provided any useful guidance? What alternative protections such as local listing have been explored? Regarding HGV movements, existing HGV movements on the site are between 7 and 10 per day or between 35 and 50 per week. Information received last night states that this scheme will result in an average increase of three per hour. This could result in more than 100 additional HGVs on the roads of Woodley each week. But imagine how many more movements there would be if one or more of the units were to become a distribution centre. Where is the modelling for this? What is the worst case scenario for HGV movements? Condition 11 states that signage will be used to ensure all HGVs enter and exit via Headley Road East. Signage alone will not prevent drivers using GPS from turning into Viscount Way via Miles Way. How can vehicles which have entered into Viscount Way by mistake then be prevented from using Gemini Road, a residential road, to access Headley Road East? The splain would need to be redesigned so that no vehicles can turn right into that service road. What will prevent vehicles departing from Unit 9 and 10 exiting via Viscount Way rather than the service road? I'm concerned that if enforcement of the condition and implementation of the delivery and service plan is left to the site owners or the tenants, it simply will not happen. What power will WBC retain to ensure that good practice is maintained at all times? Regarding noise and air pollution, page 52 of the agenda, paragraph 5, states that the cumulative impact of pollution is not material in this case. I beg to differ. It certainly is material to my residents who are in despair at the prospect of increased noise and airborne pollution. The officer's report acknowledges that units 9 and 10 will have an adverse impact on nearby residents. Noise from reversing HGVs and roller shutters will add considerably to the existing noise nuisance. Unit 10 is far too close to dwellings in Baker's Place and the proposed mitigation is inadequate. Why is an environmental, environmental impact assessment not needed? The cumulative impact of noise and airborne pollution from this development must be considered in the context of the wider area as per paragraph 185 of the MPPF. I agree that the new application cannot be expected to fix existing problems, but equally it should not be allowed to make things worse. The health and well-being of our residents should outweigh all other considerations and I urge you not to approve this application. Thank you. Thank you. Members, Stephen, and then Gary. I'm sorry, I thought I'd switch it on, but clearly haven't. Uh, just very quickly, though, I should start by, by, by saying in response to Keith's point, um, this is this is not a political committee. This is a, a committee that uh, is a quasi judicial committee. So I don't think it's appropriate to try and portray it as politically directed or led. It's not. Um, now to get to the matters uh, that are really important in this application. And there are clearly three big concerns that have been expressed. Uh, one of them relates to the noise, another to the air quality uh, problems, and a final one 
to design um, and, and in particular the, the maintenance of the of the non-designated heritage asset. Noise and air quality in, in a sense can be considered together. They um, are both clearly things that potentially have enormous impact on people uh, neighboring the site. And here I would, would just as an aside say, of course, uh, we do consider things beyond the red line of the application because we consider the impact of an application on neighbors and the neighboring road network. So I, I do think we have to think in the round about this. We do always consider the impact of applications beyond the site. Um, we are in a really difficult position. Um, the expert advice on on highways, on on uh, goods, heavy goods vehicle movements, on air quality and noise is all pointing in the direction of approval. And we would need to be able to come up with some convincing um, data to be able to challenge the expert advice we've given. If we can't do that, we would be in very considerable difficulty at appeal. On the question of air quality, and particularly the air quality at Lily May's Court, we know that surveys were carried out over the winter, and those surveys uh, did not flag up a major cause for concern. However, uh, residents understandably requested that surveys be carried out in the summer months when windows would be open and there may be a very different outcome. So the ideal solution so far as air quality was concer was, is concerned would be to defer this application to allow that survey work to be done under, over the summer so that we were in the position to be able to actually assess uh, whether uh, an existing situation is going to be significantly exacerbated by uh, the air quality uh, measures uh, that, that we're going to be taking that will be able to actually see uh, how, how much of a base we're working from. Now, um, obviously, if we defer again, there is a very high risk that the applicant will go to appeal for non-determination, almost certainly. Um, that would be unfortunate because in many ways, uh, a second deferral would enable us to try and address the other issue, the issue that clearly uh, is very important to a lot of people in Woodley, and that is trying to find a way of maintaining uh, a much valued uh, heritage asset. Now, of course, uh, Historic England, uh, who are the experts in this case, uh, do not believe that uh, the headquarters building, Miles Aircroft Factory headquarters building, is worthy of, of, of being given a designated status as an heritage asset. But very clearly also, the local community feels very strongly that this is um, an important part of Woodley's history, and it should be in some way retained. Now, as I understand it, the National Planning Policy Framework, the NPPF, which you'll see frequently cited in our reports, allows local planning authorities to take a balanced view on the value of non-designated heritage assets. And that's what Graham has sought to do, to take a balanced view, and he's, obviously weighed in the balance all of the considerations about the application and you know, I, I utterly respect his approach to this but another way of taking a, a balanced view would be to take into account the very considerable local opinion that believes there should be some effort made to uh, preserve the non-designated heritage asset um, because of its value to the local community. So if we were to defer the application, uh, it would have allowed an opportunity for the applicant to explore ways in which uh, 
either the building itself, the Miles Aircraft Factory headquarters building, or at least its facade could be incorporated into the new development. But as I've said, um, the risk of uh, a further deferral is the applicant will go straight to appeal for non-determination. So there is another alternative, which is to refuse the application. But the only grounds on which we could at present uh, refuse with any confidence would be on this ground about preservation of the non-designated heritage asset, because that is one where it's possible to take an on balance view. And we as committee members can do that. We're not flying in the face of expert advice because the NPPF allows us to do that. Um, we can't, I fear, um, contradict the expert advice we're getting on, on highways, noise and air quality, much though we may wish to do so, because we just do not have the data to enable us to do so. So if we went down the route of refusal, we are not able to pursue those issues. If we went down to the route of deferral, we may be able to pursue them. So we are in a really difficult position. Let's make no bones about that. If we, we go for a refusal, it has to be on a narrow ground. We have to disregard all the other things that we are concerned about. But if we defer in order to get information on air quality that might help us to make a decision on that um, or be more confident about it, we are um, we risk uh, the applicant going straight to appeal for non-determination and losing any control. So um, I'm not yet certain which route we should go down, but that's my kind of assessment of where we are. I'm inclined at the moment to uh, go for refusal on the basis of, of the status in the minds of the local community, and a vast number of people have commented on this, of the non-designated heritage asset but I'd be very interested to hear the views of colleagues. Gary, next. Question. Oh, thank you. Um, I would agree with a lot of what Stephen says, but I would very, very slightly in some of the points. Non-designated heritage asset, and um, I would agree there's a balanced view there, and that could be looked at two ways. It's not just because English heritage haven't approved the site doesn't mean the council can't do, can't recognise it in one form or another. But looking at paragraph <coughs> nine of the report on page 53, it says, in undertaking the balanced judgments as required by the NPPF, several material benefits were set out in the previous report, which he summarises. And you turn over the page next place. Reduce noise from the current use through improved design and orientation of buildings. Um, that can't be quantified one way or another, because um, very simply, um, what's going in the buildings? Are there going to be um, heavy engineering? Is it going to be a, a distribution center or is it going to be something else? Until one understands what will happen within the buildings, do we have any idea of what noise and pollution might be generated through the building? If it's a distribution center, and we all know the problems with ASDA over late night deliveries, if it's a distribution center, it'll probably want to do make deliveries 24 seven without having the slightest idea of what's going on in the buildings. We're not in a position to be able to, as I see it, estimate is it an increase of three lorries, HGVs there for 100 a week, or is it a lot more? Will they be coming in late at night? Will they be backing up lorries with all the horns and hooters going, disturbing neighbours late at night? None of this is is referred to in, in, in the report, and I think they're important. <clears throat> Paragraph uh, five makes a reference to um, uh, cannot fix existing problems outside the red line, and that's that's a fairly valid comment, but it shouldn't make what's going on outside the red line worse. 
And the red line, I think, is really a red herring because if you go back to Arborfield Garrison as an SCL, we put a red line around it and we said, that's it, we're containing development of the countryside within that red line. But what happened to the planners do? They took a bit, bolted on a bit to the side and they said, because within that red line there are facilities, therefore we can build outside the red line because the facilities within the, in the red line meets it. So the red line is a red herring. But there's definitely, if it affects residents uh, outside, and there are medical records we got from uh, residents in a block of flats, uh, and they, they make point, may make a point of this, we have to take a note of that. But until I know what's going on in the buildings, how many lorries are going there, will they be working 24-7, whatever, I'm not in a position to um, uh, go along with this. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, it shouldn't. It should not make the situation worse. And without that information, I don't know. Then there's mention of ecology of planting um, uh, removal of 25 trees and planting 100 trees. But as we know, this council does not monitor the trees it plants. So therefore, there's no guarantee we'll have those 100 in 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 five years' time. Um, the occupation, uh, the occupation, or the occupants, and what their function and trade and the hours they work is really cute, crucial to be able to, to determine this. The other point is, and we've had this before in this committee, Viscount Way. Oh, no HGVs and Viscount Way. We'll only allow them to go into the two buildings. You can't stop a man in a lorry with a driving license driving down a legal road. He can go any way he likes. You might put a sign up and say, please don't go there. You can't stop him unless you close the road, unless you actually block off the complete access of Viscount Way into that, into that development. It is a balance of judgment. And climate emergency comes into it. If we are going to allow more lorries on the road and they're polluting HGVs, um, we're affecting climate emergency, and that's something this council should be fighting. Um, so so it, it, I, I'm happy to listen to what other people say, but I'm, I'm very uncomfortable with this planning application, and I would actually like to be able to assist, get assistance from officers as to a route we could go if we were determined we wish to refuse it. Thank you. Uh, Graham, could you respond to Gary's comments about the uh, noise, about the delivery times, the operation, the red line being a red herring or not, or blue herring or some other color herring, and also um, anything else? Yellow. Yellow herring, he says, okay. Graham, are you there? So, in terms of what's going in there, in the mirror, I think I'd just like to explore it. We're saying things like distribution centres, and I just want to make sure that we're, we're not confusing that with a large scale um, warehouse, you know, Amazon type thing, because that is not what this is. We are looking at a mixed use scheme for B2, B8, uh, and what was B1C, um, and they are relatively small units. So to say kind of distribution centre is, is not the right way to, to think about it. At the moment, there are no restrictions on what happens in terms of the amount of hours that they work or the amount of deliver the amount of hours in terms of when deliveries can arrive at the site. That would essentially remain the case with the exception that units nine and 10 have a restriction on the delivery hours, and that's during night time. The point about how the orientation of the buildings impacts that is that in particular units one to eight, so the, the two main buildings in the middle of the site have been deliberately set that way so that all of the activity in terms of deliveries and, and people moving about in the yard, all of that occurs within the two buildings. So you actually reduce a lot of the impact by that. So that's what was meant by the improved design and orientation of the buildings. Chris. Um, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
I mean, there's a few things to cover. But Sorry, Chris. I, I mean, if you, do you want clarification on yeah, anything please. else? Yeah, I, that's fine. Um, in, in terms of it, it shouldn't make the impacts worse, that is what we are saying. As officers, we are recommending this application for approval because we have referred this to our, consulta our consultees, sorry, and they understand the, the technical um, level of detail and they are saying that this is acceptable. And from that, as a officer, we are then making that recommendation for approval based on that. And they are saying that through the support, the reports that have been submitted, the impacts would not be any worse than they are now. That is why we are then saying what we're saying. I, I, I do get what you mean by in terms of the red line, but at the same time, it is a very important part of planning. It, is, it defines where the planning application is and, and what is actually being applied for, where it actually occurs. So it is important to understand where it is and what else you know, is around it. I think a, a, to describe this in a slightly different way, a, a good analogy would be if we were considering, let's say, a redevelopment house, so demolition of house uh, and rebuild, uh, it was going from two bedroom to four bedroom, we would say that you need to provide parking that is sufficient for that new four bedroom house. What we would not be saying is that you need to provide parking for the house and parking for the neighbour down the road that has got numerous cars stored there because they like cars. That is, again, what we are saying as officers, that's quite a, a fundamental part of what we are trying to, to put across and why we're recommending approval. In terms of um, the tree planting, yes, it, it does fall to us as the council, yes, to monitor that people do um, implement their planning permissions as they have stated. Yes, we do to a certain extent rely on uh, residents in order to understand that, that that is a essentially a resource issue. There will be no council anywhere that has anybody that goes around their own boroughs and, and manages to you know, look at every single site. But certainly that is something that we can monitor. Um, I would say that you have to consider the application on its merits and the information that has been provided. And they are stating that they will plant that many trees. We have to base it on that. We cannot base it on a, well, they might do this, they might do that. That's simply not what, what we can do. Can we stop HGG drivers? Yes, I, I can see your point that, yes, it could be difficult to physically be there and stop them. However, what we are saying is that through uh, delivery and service plan, through signage on and adjacent to the site, we would feel that that is acceptable. The applicant has indicated that they will also put that into the lease of their units, into the, the actual lease agreement. That is not something that we would consider in terms of because it's not uh, under the Planning Act, but it's a point nonetheless. So whilst, again, yes, we may not be able to physically stop them, we do have to consider what is in front of us. And the information being stated is that they will not use Viscount Way other than for the access to units 9 and 10. Is that sufficient or is there anything further? <clears throat> it's interesting. I mean, I don't know what's going in there. And you say it's not Amazon, it's mixed use. I don't know if there'll be lorries turning up at four o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning or eight o'clock in the morning. I don't know this. I know in Asda there's a restriction that they can't come in late at night. I think it's something like nine or 10.30 because of disturbed neighbours and they can't come in at six o'clock in the morning. There's no conditions like that assigned here. Um, when you actually said that it's, it's, it's really, there's no restrictions and it's 24-7. And so therefore anybody can turn up with any lorry making any amount of noise 24 7 and uh, all the residents around are affected and if you can't say that's not going to go outside the red line well then uh, i think it's probably a, a misjudgment again as i said uh, you you say you make a reference on about um balance of judgment 
and you'll control the traffic, yet you can't control the HCVs. You can make an attempt to, but you can't, you can't actually do it. Um, and as with the trees, the council has already admitted that it does not survey trees within the five-year plan. So therefore, any trees that are planted, um, if they die, they're not replaced. So in, in terms of climate emergency, it's, 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 not, it's not very good. Anyway, I'll leave it for others, but thank you. Chris? Thank you. Um, I'd like to associate uh, myself with Stephen's remark about the committee itself. It is non-party political, and I'm sure it will continue in that vein. Um, this is um, very difficult. There's, there's two lots of guessing the officers have got to do. They've got to work out what is actually going to take place on the site. And then they've got to work out what the effect of that's going to be. And if we're going to ref refuse this, we've got to do a guess as, as well. And we are lay members of the council, which makes it very difficult. But I want to go back to the point that Graham made about the there being currently no limit on HGVs. If we look at what is currently consented, if we were, to, for example, to refuse because uh, we suspect too many HGV movements, would that not be, in planning terms, illogical as there are no current restrictions in place? Yeah, it would be quite difficult. What, what you would need to do is demonstrate there is harm in planning terms as a result of HGV movements from this development. And part of the consideration of that would be what is the impact of the existing use. Um, I might bring Chris in actually on, on that point, I think, in, in terms of just exploring the HGV use and kind of how we've arrived at the figures that we have. Evening, everybody. Um, I guess welcome to a number of the new members that are on the planning committee and to yourself, Michelle. Um, just uh, so uh, how these schemes are looked at, uh, uh, and an officer would take this scheme through. They'll start off by looking at the existing, and the existing um, floor space on this site, if I recall, was uh, 13,700 13, or towards 14,000 square metres. And the proposed total is around 16,300 or something like that. So there's, um, there's, you know, there's not a significant jump. Now, when assessing an application, you look at kind of trip rates, um, TRIX is a national industry tool that is used across the 600 businesses and local authorities across the country, uh, and as well as using uh, either existing data from the scheme that's put forward in front of us, or from obviously data that we have from other surrounding businesses and, and, and schemes that we're aware of. And the applicant, uh, sorry, the applicant has obviously put forward a transport assessment, uh, but the officers obviously scrutinise that and obviously do their own assessments and check. Now, based on that, tr the trip rate, for example, that's been identified, um, you apply it to the, the square meterage for the existing, and obviously you apply it to the square meterage for the new, and that's the difference that has been identified. So the difference is between two and three HGV movements per hour. So you're coming in at, you know, if, if it's worst case of three, then you're talking one every 20 minutes um, of an hour throughout the day. Um, and, and that's broadly, I know that sounds really simple, that's the very short uh, answer as to how we get to that, um, but there are trip rates associated with every land use, uh, and that's typical. And as Stephen mentioned, if we end up at a planning appeal, then that's exactly the trip rates that they'll be discussing, uh, and that's how they'll also arrive at a very similar situation and position that the officers have, and obviously the planning officer has in terms of making his determination. Um, and and I think just talking on, touching on some of the other points. There is a parking management strategy that has been secured by condition, uh, and that will obviously look at the not only the park, but the surrounding areas, including the residential routes. Uh, and details of that can be obviously worked up with the parish uh, and the local members, uh, as well as um, it's the signing strategy as well. So again, that hasn't been determined as yet because obviously the scheme's not built. And you're right, Gary, and other office, other members that have mentioned this, we don't know the end users that are going to be in there yet. So. We only have, as I say, going back to these trip rates. I do appreciate that you, know, you, you are right. Some of these smaller units, uh, they all have uh, HGV loading bays. Now, we're only assuming, we can't be certain that, that the, the applicant has implemented those or planning to implement those to kind of future-proof the building. But 
a lot of the buildings for the sizes that, that Graham's indicated, they wouldn't usually have a HGV coming to them. It, it would normally be a smaller vehicle, a smaller van, uh, a light or even a heavy goods, but not to the size of an Arctic. But the buildings have obviously been set up to obviously accommodate those features. Um, and I, I think, you know, in, in the round, that's exactly where we've got to. We've looked at the parking. Uh, there's a condition that secures the parking to ensure the split of um, the bit, the uses is correct because obviously there is two elements of use there. If one was slightly higher than the other, then obviously it encourages more HDVs and obviously more parking. Uh, so we've made that balance and we've secured it at 35%, which gives you the balance that we've kind of got to in terms of parking and obviously a, a good balance with the HDV levels close to um, the existing. Uh, it's only just increased slightly because of the floor space uh, where those calculations have come from. So um, I hope that kind of helps. Um, I'm here if there's any other questions that you've got on that point. Could I just mention, um, the, the air quality question, um, we do need to, to determine it in terms of planning, but there is an environmental health department in the council which could swing into action if things went horribly wrong, so it's not, not the end of the road if, um, if we were to approve and air quality didn't turn out to be as good as we expected. John? Thank you. Um, I mean, this, this is a, the quandary that we're faced. Um, is this the best use of the land? Commercial and housing does not sit well. Um, and I understand what you say about uh, you can unwind it later, but we all know the problems we've had with Lily May Court. My view in this is that we have very little information with regards to what the usage is going to be. Um, People live there 24-7. It's their lives, it's their homes, it's their children, it's their health. I could not support this application without more details. And I could not support a deferral on the basis of what Stephen has just said with regards to that if we go for deferral, we may end up losing an appeal for being out of time. So I just think we have to err on the safe side for this. Now, I know it may not fit well with uh, the MPPF and we probably lose at appeal, but I I cannot, I mean, it's not the best use of the land, is it? I mean, we see this all the time. We, we give planning permission to housing and we know what will happen is that the housing will push out the, the industrial. And I just can't support it, to be honest with you. Andrew and then Stephen. Yes, thank you, Chair. As has been um, said tonight, uh, there are at least three key issues. There's the matter of heritage value, environmental health, including noise and air quality. And there are also uh, road safety and associated matters, including numbers of HGV movements um, in the vicinity. I also take very much on board um, the comments that were made tonight uh, by the leader of um, Woodley Town Council about the cumulative impacts um, uh, of uh, these, should some of these, should the application be um, approved. I would like, um, firstly, officer clarification, exactly what the MPPF says about um, cumulative impacts and um, our ability to um, um, uh, to to consider these as material um, issues. I would also like to pick up on the question, one of the questions that Councillor Boyd um, asked, um, and that is, um, um, uh, it would be very instructive, I think, for us to uh, hear what investigation um, has been undertaken for retaining the facade um, of the HQ um, building. Um, if the application was approved, um, what would be the main sources of noise and air pollution from the site within the red line? Um, it was suggested during the site visit that the noise levels would be less than at present. Can officers please summarise some of the reasons uh, for that conclusion? Um, and uh, final question, if I may, and uh, sorry, I'm going back to a heritage issue. Um, can we clarify whether the Secretary of State has responded to Historic England's recommendation against listing the building? And if so, whether this would preclude any further attempt to secure a national listing? Uh, so taking the perhaps the listed building aspects first, 
well, not list of buildings, sorry. Um, what has happened in terms of discussions about the you know, retaining the facade? Essentially, none it is the you know, short, simple answer, because we are not required to do so. Um, I would, without wishing to sound like a, a broken record, I would highlight the, the point that is said at the start of every planning committee. We are here to determine valid planning applications in accordance with planning policy, not to suggest alternatives or if they are a good idea or a bad idea. We have assessed this application in line with planning policy in terms of the heritage aspects. We have gone through that in, in quite detail, in you know, lots of detail in terms of the last committee and, and the reports, but in, in brief, what we are saying is that there is obviously a local interest, a local significance, um, but we are, then we are required to make a balanced judgment and we are saying the benefits outweigh that local interest. What Stephen said earlier um, is completely correct. As members, if you feel that you would place greater weight on that local significance and less weight on the significance, you could ultimately change the balance and potentially reach a reason for refusal. That is potentially you know, something that members could do. From that, what we are saying is basically we do not consider that to be the case. Therefore, we have not got to a point where we have said we need to consider what would it be like to keep the facade of the building. Probably worth pointing out, as members saw on, on the site visit and we had a look around the building, had a look inside the building, there was not much there that we considered, or well, sorry, that we could see that would be worthy of retaining. In terms of what the, the, the process is in terms of listing, a listing request was put forward to Historic England. They considered it and as stated on site, that's a case of they look at all the things that have been submitted, they visit the site, they um, assess all the information that is provided and I understand you know, quite a significant amount of information provided by, by a resident. Um, they weigh that up and then present a case, much like we are here, they present a case to the Secretary of State. Secretary of State will then consider all of that and will come to a determination. They have responded in the sense of saying, we agree with the recommendation of Historic England to not list the building. And then that follows through Historic England have sent out the results of a listing designation saying that they will not list it. What that does in terms of future um, aspects, I, I suppose you certainly could argue that you could put forward another case. Somebody could submit another request. Um, presumably, it would be you would have to demonstrate there is something else that was not considered before for them to come to a different conclusion. But I, without knowing the exact process, but I presume that you could do that. Does that answer that question? Yeah. Okay, David. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you all know, I'm new to this, so I seek permission to be naive and young and idealistic, or at least some of those things. Um, I went to this, visit the site earlier this week, and I think there are some fundamentals. Firstly, there are two quite different issues being combined here. There is the question of how we redevelop an, or should we redevelop an industrial area, and there's the heritage aspects, and the, uh, those issues are quite, I think, quite different. We, we perhaps should consider them separately. The thought that occurs to me is, do we actually want to redevelop this site at any time? It's an old, from what I could see in my non expert opinion, it's an old site. It's not improving with age um, and for business to conduct, to be conducted in that location. At some point, it will need to be improved uh, and significantly redeveloped. I take uh, Councillor Kaiser's point that every time you try and redevelop an industrial unit amidst housing, it uh, causes problems. So I suppose the fundamental question is, if we didn't go ahead with this application, what sort of application would we go ahead that had a commercial use? Or are we simply saying we should be thinking about rezoning this whole area as housing? Um, I don't think that's part of the plan of the council to consider that. Uh, and therefore we should think about this as saying it's a industrial site, it will remain an industrial site and how therefore do we consider the best use of it? 
if it stays as an industrial site, there will be lorry movements. Um, we don't know how many, and um, we can put sort of uh, some restrictions and conditions in place. And I note the new uh, exit road onto Headley Road, uh, which hopefully will take traffic out of Viscount Way. Um, I would have thought it's within the wit of the council officers to come up with more firm mitigations to make sure that heavy goods vehicles don't go down Viscount Way. And I know there's another unit uh, further up the road that we need to consider. Um, but that is something I would have thought we can get some kind of further action on. I think the fundamental issue for me with regard to the industrial usage is this question of air quality. We've heard a lot from council officers and from the applicant about red lines. And I know that lorries respect red lines and bricks respect red lines, but air and air particles do not respect red lines. They cross over. And I think we need to bear that in mind. Um, and that if there's any doubt about that, we should seek further information, particularly on air quality in the summer when the whole environment is different to winter. Um, when the climate may actually suppress some of the particles in the air. So I do think there's a fundamental question that we haven't got enough information about the impact on health. Um, I think moving to the heritage aspects of this, I have a great deal of sympathy uh, with the, the points made, but I wonder whether the points being made about the heritage aspect are about the building specifically or about what the building represents. The building specifically, again, in my uh, in expert eye, looks pretty decayed. Um, it's not as an attractive an example of Art Deco architecture as I've seen elsewhere. Um, and if it wasn't for the linkage with the aerodrome, would we be seeking to protect it simply on its age and, and merits of Art Deco design? I think possibly not. Um, if what we are concerned about and what local people are concerned about is the historic symbolism of that building, then it might have been helpful if the developers had come up with an alternative proposal to mark what Woodley Aerodrome was and what the building represents. Um, Andy, in his com uh, comment or presentation, mentioned a small plaque. Uh, I didn't have in mind a small plaque. I had in mind a rather substantial monument, uh, which would be visible for people traveling up and down Headley Road, as many of us do, to stir, which would actually state very clearly the heritage of the place and give the local community something to be proud of. Um, so I think something more imaginative could have been put forward there, and that may or may not have allied some of the concerns that local residents feel about the, the loss of memory of what the aerodrome was. But one thing I feel very passionate about, and I'm sure all members feel the same, is the concept of democratic consent. We've heard a lot from the officers and indeed from the developers about what we should and should not do and what we're constrained from doing as elected members, and I respect that, and there is obviously a process in place. But that process exists at the will of the people. And there have been a very significant volume of comments and complaints about the, or voices of concern, let's say, about this development. And we would not be doing our duty if we simply reduced ourselves to the level of a computer algorithm and said, because it confers to this policy and this policy, therefore we must simply go ahead and approve it. I don't believe that's what we're here to do. I personally, as we're sitting here, am minded to think that a deferment would be a good thing to give the chance for the developer to come back with some additional memorial proposals that puts uh, that reassures the local residents that heritage is not being lost. I think we do need more information about air quality, and I think we need a more um, clearly defined definition of what the impact on track on vehicle movements are likely to be up and down Viscount Way. The option of deferral is is available to you as members by all means. What I would say is that it significantly raises the risk that the application is challenged by way of an appeal. I think if you were to defer on you need to defer or indeed refuse on the right grounds and if you do not it would open up the likelihood of the of an uh, sorry of costs being awarded at an appeal i would also highlight that inspectors generally are very stringent on conditions and may not necessarily agree with some of the conditions that we are recommending so you do run the risk if we go to appeal that you end up with the development with less conditions and with costs awarded against the council 
it is, as I've said, it is your right to defer if, if you feel that's the way you want to go. But it is, of course, the applicant's right to appeal as part of the planning system. Stephen. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, this has been uh, a really difficult application. I think all of us are concerned about issues of air quality, about noise, uh, the heavy goods vehicle movements. Um, sadly, I don't think we can actually, as a planning committee, do anything about those um, as things stand. If we went for a deferral, um, that, I, in my judgment, would automatically trigger an appeal on the applicant's part for non-determination. Uh, we would be then defending an appeal without any of that information available to us that we want to get later because it wouldn't be available. Um, that's that's the, the, the bind in which we find ourselves. And in my view, the only safe ground, the only safe ground, and I, even that, there is a question mark about how safe it is. But the only grounds I think that we could refuse this on are the grounds that it that, that the MPPF allows us as the local planning authority to take a balanced view on the value of non-designated heritage assets. In that sense, the fact that uh, Historic England have not given this um, designated heritage asset status is not important. Uh, even as a non-designated heritage asset, we are entitled to take a balanced view on its value. And as I said earlier, um, I entirely respect that the officers have sought to, to, to balance uh, what is clearly considerable public support for this building with, um, or the historic building, with what they see as benefits of the scheme. And as Graham said, it is in our power to decide that the balance lies in a slightly different way. And that is my view. I think there are very few applications I've seen in many years on this committee that have excited so much interest and so much commitment from members of the public to preserve an historic building. And I think um, that, to me, carries very significant weight and it needs for us to carry very significant weight. This is viewed in the com local community as a vital part of the built heritage of Woodley. So I would propose that we refuse this application because it fails to preserve the Mars Aircraft Factory headquarters building or even its facade. Um, and I would refer in support of the refusal to the NPPF uh, allowing a local planning authority to take a balanced view of the value of non-designated heritage assets. Okay. And I'd be yeah. happy if somebody were to second that reason for refusal. No, I was just thinking um, generally <clears throat> the public opinion you don't add up the number of people who have um, put forward the same point. It's not relevant. You either, The point is either made or not made, and it's made, it's considered. But in, with regard to the heritage asset, people are express, expressing, uh, expressing a subjective op uh, opinion. And I think that's rather different. I think um, that does carry more weight when there are more people in the area who do seem to appreciate it. I don't know how many... Do you know how many uh, 4, people, how many? 4,500 4, signed the petition. 4,500 4, signed the yes. petition. Okay, so I think I think that does carry weight. Thank you. Gary, just the last speaker for, and then we're going to vote. Yeah, on. no, the, the, the only comment I, I, I would, I, I'm, I, I, I'll go along with the recommendation, but um, I do feel that um, the report is is inadequate in the sense that it does not provide sufficient information on um, 
uh, noise and air quality. Um, and a point I make, one, one comment made there was it wouldn't normally have HGVs. And there's no certainty in a comment like that. You need certainty. You've got to be able to say that currently the 100, 100 vehicles use that route uh, a week. Now it'll be two or 300. There's lots of little information. Like the, 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 the report is quite flawed in, in the sense that it doesn't provide sufficient information. But what, the point I really want to highlight is um, the, the remark made by the officer that costs awards at appeals. And in a way, I'm, I'm very uh, disheartened at hearing that because the costs award of appeals are not a re issue for the planning committee. It's really a way of trying to um, lever them into a particular direction. And costs award of appeals are not a consideration of this planning committee. Yes, Stephen, could you please give us the reasons for your refusal, please? I think I have given you the reasons for refusal, uh, Chair, um, but I'm, I'm, and there is only one. It's the application fails to preserve the Mars Aircraft Factory headquarters building or it's even its facade, uh, and then I use the NPPF as, as backup for that. Um, what I wanted to say was that although we, because of the reasons that have been fully explained by several of us now, um, are not able to pursue the issues of air quality and noise and heavy goods vehicle movements because the expert advice we have doesn't allow us to do so, that does not preclude when this goes to appeal, which it almost certainly will, um, all those interested parties who have spoken this evening will have the opportunity to address uh, the appeal inspector and make those points on the basis of local knowledge. We as a committee cannot pursue those issues tonight. We can't include them in our reasons for refusal, much as we might want to, but it doesn't stop you raising those points at the appeal. There's one comment by the officer. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to, just responding to to a few points, um, and most recently, uh, the councillor's comments um, with sort of the outline um, reasons for refusal. This this is uh, as you have discussed tonight. It is a complex application. It is a difficult decision to make with many competing heritage environmental um, issues and the balance that the officers have have had to undertake is unfortunately not as simple as a sort of a black and white binary decision many many different pros and cons have to go on to the weighing scales to come to this balance and as as you've as you've rightly noted tonight some of those are more quantifiable than others some of those we have more data on than others some of those there is a greater deal of uncertainty especially when we as an authority, do not have control over who may occupy a building in the future. Likewise, we don't have a degree of control over who may occupy the building as it currently stands. So there is, I agree with councillors, and I'd make the point: it is not an easy, um, it is not an easy decision to make, and it's not an easy set of uh, information to digest. A, a sort of a point of note on on deferral. If members were to decide, and it doesn't sound like it will, but if members were to decide on deferral, members would need to be, the committee would need to be clear upon what information or what reason you were deferring now that wasn't or did not exist at the previous committee. We have a set of minutes um, and we have a previous committee where this was debated and deferred for a site visit. So it's just a, a point of order that if a deferral is considered, the reasons need to, to be accompanied. That's my thing. Thank you. Is it a proposal? In, okay, sorry. In, in terms of the, in terms of refusal, the um, as I, as I hear it, the uh, reason for refusal is a failure to preserve to uh, it preserve the existing building. Reference to the facade possibly is not necessarily as relevant and strong as the a building as it is entirety, because the proposal and the discussions over alternatives we had this debate at the previous committee where alternative proposals are not relevant to what's in front of us. The proposal is to remove the building and by its removal that is its harm on its significance as its removal in its entirety. Just, just to understand it's properly you're recommending I remove the reference to the facade. I would because the facade itself whilst it's part of its significance as yeah. other councillors have highlighted there is a whole package that builds to okay. local significance I'm happy to do rather that. than one specific element. Yeah.
I'm happy to do that. Thank so you. The, the, the reason for refusal now is the application fails to preserve the Mars Aircraft Factory headquarters building. Can I also just confirm whether there was any environmental protection reasons for refusal? Air quality noise, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. We'll go to a vote now. All of those in favor of the refusal, please raise your hands. That's unanimous. That's unanimous. Okay, we need to agree to wording for the refusal. Yes. Yeah, we'll, we'll yes. get to the tape, it's fine. Yeah. yeah. Since we need to be moving along today, uh, could we please uh, go on to agenda item nine, uh, application 220654, please. James is the officer. Thanks, Chair. Can everyone hear me? Yes, yes, thank you, James. Good evening. Um, the site address for this application is 14 Chilton Drive, Charville. The application seeks to vary condition two of application 212989, which was for the proposed direction of a single story rear extension. Condition, condition two relates to the approved plans and the variation is to allow an increase in the height of the roof of the now retrospective development. The approved plans under the previous application indicated a height of approximately 2.65 metres, whereas the extension has been constructed with a height of approximately 2.9 metres. The application was deferred from the previous planning committee so that the members could get a better understanding of the context of the site and any impact on the neighbouring dwelling. There were several key discussion points raised throughout the site visit, one of these being how will the drainage system impact the neighbouring property number 12 once installed, the uh, concern was whether there would be any features of the drainage that would overhang into the neighbouring land. As you can see from the rear elevation, there are the proposed drainage system consists of guttering and downpipes on the rear elevation. These will connect to a soakway in the rear of the application site. There will be no impact on the adjacent dwelling in this respect. Uh, the height of the extension was also queried, more specifically whether it complied with the proposed plans. After correspondence with the enforcement officer who dealt with the site, it was confirmed that the extension matched the height stated in the application form and what is indicated under the current plans. As such, the recommendation is unchanged. The application is recommended for approval subject to conditions listed in the report. Thank you. OK, the speaker for this is Mr. Poggi. No, no, Murphy. Ah, sorry, wrong one, wrong person. Danny Murphy, uh, are you here? And there's, I believe he has some slides too. The officer is going to present. Councillor Sam Atkar at the last committee meeting. Is it on? OK, um, from a prepared state. Not even to have it listed. He did not act as a mediator between us or any other neighbour and the owner. I see the supplementary notes show Sam's reason for listing as potential. Will this be the technicality, the sole question the committee can base their decision on tonight and ignore the other reasons residents wanted it listed? I object to the persistent breaches and building on and over our boundary, resulting in cumulative loss of light and amenity. I'm glad so many members attended the site visit, but disappointed we weren't allowed to participate in the discussions. The committee relying solely on the word and evidence of the planning officer. Accurate drawings and use them in the decision for the original retro application to 
The same planning officer that used this photo in slide one at the last meeting to prove the rear extension maps taken July 2019 and shows no recent ex extensions. Next slide, please. Here's a recent photo of the front of the property showing the recent extensions and the obtrusive angles which are visible from the street. Next slide, please. The same planning officer presented this photo on the left taken in November before the original retro application was decided to prove the further change is minimal and has no impact. Contrast that with the up-to-date photo. Next slide, please. To add more confusion, the plans have changed yet again, yet still no attempt to correct the inaccurate details that have consistently hidden the changes and impact on the western boundary. These issues are indicative of what we have faced dealing with the Council over stress of three sets of plans, two enforcement investigations, two retro planning applications, two committee meetings and one site visit. The reasons for this retro application, the steel, the extra height, the obtrusive angles were all known before the original retro application was decided. Why were they not dealt with then? Why did planning accept and continue to accept inaccurate plans? Why are they allowing retro applications on top of retro applications? If the guidance is not applicable in this scenario, I cannot think of any other scenario it would apply. It's little wonder residents have lost faith in the process when their voices are con constantly dismissed while the council manipulate the facts to, to support their decisions. They've got validation officers, planning officers, enforcement officers, but no accountability for anything. As last time, I would ask that you consider the previous developments and breaches and cumulative effects on neighbours and the wider area. Thank you. OK, Jeff Simi, the agent. Can I, someone, someone keeps. Can I say something? Yeah. So, sorry, if you just give me one moment. Sorry. Somebody on Teams keeps muting the uh, the David Hicks AV microphone. So, can you please refrain from doing that? And if you continue, we will have to adjourn the meeting and uh, reconvene it. So that's just a just a comment. Thank you. OK, good evening. Proceed. Sorry. Sorry. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jeff Simi from Bluebird Design Services. I represent Mr and Mrs Hargens, the applicant. The current application is for varying the condition to of application 212989. Original planning application was approved for the rear extension and the, at number 14 Chilton Drive. This application should only consider so, solely for the varying condition two of the previously approved planning application. The main points for consideration on these applications are the extension that replaces the previous structure and extension that was higher than the current extension. There was a pitch roof adjacent to number 12 Chilton Drive boundary that was higher than the current flat roof that replaced it. The current extension is a smaller in length than the original uh, extension that replaced it. We have submitted photos to the planning officer demonstrating that there are no shadow cast over the adjacent property at number 12 Chilton Drive. The properties at, num at Pennine Way are not affected because of the works at number 14 Chilton Drive and their subject objection should be dismissed. The small height increase is as a result of change of fall on the, on the roof away from number 12 Chilton Drive, an existing steel structure that replaces the previous extension. The skylights are in the center of the extension away from the adjacent properties. Thus, there are no overlooking or light impact adjacent properties. We have never tried to hide or misrepresent the height increase. In fact, our client invited residents of number 12 
Chiltern Drive to come and see the extension and discuss it. Finally, some of the language used by the objectors are well below the expected standard of neighbourly behaviour. We would like to thank the committee team for taking their time to visit the, the site for consideration of this application. Our client tried to reach out to the parish council, but were refused meeting to discuss this application with our client. Thank you again. Thank you. The first, oh, sorry, Sam, yeah, I was going to say, Sam, just going to that. Sam Akhtar on Teams. Sam, would you like to start speaking? Hello. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you everyone for for, for listening on to this and all the committee members. And uh, yeah, just just you know, from, from my side, just really really keen for for, for both parties and, and everyone to get resolution on this. Um, you know, I was be, being involved in, in in speaking to both uh, neighbours on, on, on for this property, and um, you know, I, it's definitely been quite a, a sort of emotive uh, on, on both sides, and I appreciate you know emotions can ride quite high and i just wanted to say look you know whatever happens today i just want both parties to hopefully shake hands and hopefully we could sort of move on and um, get a solution after today so thank you very much for everyone any speakers andrew yes thank you chair um, and James and to everyone who's else who's presented um, this evening. Um, I would like um, to ask officers for some clarification um, about the previous structure that has been demolished to make way for the uh, most recent um, um, uh, extension. Um, am I correct um, in believing that that was a glass um, or similar conservatory, um, not a brick building? The second question or the second comment that I would make, and this is a comment as opposed to a question, um, but I'm very pleased that the officers were able to organize the, the site visit. Um, of course, I attended that visit um, uh, with a completely open mind, but my feeling was when we visited this, when I visited the site, that I felt that height was an issue. It may be 25 centimetres higher than that was approved, than that was, was approved, but this does add to my feelings that the building is overbearing. Um, should this application um, be approved, however, I would like uh, to suggest um, uh, an informative. The drawings show a rather large skylight protruding well above the roof line. It does extend well above the existing roof line. At night, when house lights are on, this is likely to be visible, highly visible, with a distraction to a number of properties, and there are a number of them overlooking the site. And so my request, my informative um, um, uh, would be um, to request that the applicants install interior blinds in the skylight to shield neighboring properties from light pollution. So one question about the nature of the previous structure, which may have been higher than the um, new uh, structure, but was it of a different materials? Uh, yeah, the previous structure was a conservatory um, glass material. Um, in terms of the informative, um, what I was comment on that is that the uh, size is quite nothing too excessive um it's quite a standard roof like the roof lantern that you would see on many rear extensions similar to the one proposed um perhaps um brian you would have a good idea about an informative on that but it's quite unusual um from what i've dealt with Thank you, James. Yeah, I think um, as, as members know, there, there's no sort of legal uh, legal strength in an informative. And what members do have to understand is whether the previous structure had existed or the approved structure at 25 uh, to 25 centimetres lower had existed, there likely wouldn't be any restriction on how much light could be generated from any single storey rear extension, as there is not 
any restriction on how much light someone can emit from a bedroom window with curtains open or closed. So we're sort of straying into controlling the interior living arrangements of someone's house, which is not justified necessarily or would meet any of the, the tests um, for any kind of planning restriction or condition. Stephen and then Gary. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I find this one very difficult. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to go on the site visit, and that might have helped me um, a lot. But I, I've seen it from the outside, the site from the outside, but I'm not sure that's sufficient, really, to be able to, to form the judgment, because Andrew's concern seems to be about um, the bulk and the, the massing of this and how, how that has an impact. Uh, a, a difficult task is is working out whether um, whether the difference uh, is a material consideration or not. I really have enormous sympathy for Mr. Murphy, uh, who has clearly uh, had persistent uh, problems with multiple applications coming along. Um, it seems that though several have been retrospective been persistent differences between what's been approved and what's been built uh, and that obviously erodes confidence and creates real uh, tension I think between neighbours and I, I can understand exactly why he feels so exercised about this but I, I'm not sure what we can do as a planning committee to resolve this in the way that Mr Murphy would like. I'm, I'm not sure whether we really would be deemed reasonable to ask for this uh, extra bit to be taken down. I can really only rely on the colleagues that went on the site visit for your impression of whether Andrew's feeling that this does constitute some overbearing uh, uh, development is 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 a, a ground for proceeding. Gary. Well, thank you. I, I couldn't make the site visit, so to be quite honest, I think I'll abs I'll abstain from the vote because it does feel very sensitive. I do feel sorry for Mr. Murphy in the sense that it, it's uh, fairly we all experience this with many a planning application in our wards where there is dispute between neighbours and um, unfortunately they, they they don't always get resolved. Um, but I just need a point of clarification on page 151. It's for my own interest more than anything else. Um, and it's, it's from the parish council. It says, given the situation and the fact that the law allows just one attempt to gain permission for unauthorised development, the parish council believes that this application to vary condition two should be refused, as application has set a dangerous precedent in encouraging other unauthorised developments. The reason I ask the question is that I, I don't know if there's any truth in this statement, and I would just like clarification for future reference. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah, an application cannot be refused on grounds that it is retrospective. OK, so the fact that something has been done unlawfully, Section 73A of the Town and Country Plan Act allows the applicant to apply to regularise that unlawful development. If it's refused, then it moves to the next step. But at the moment, a decision hasn't been made, so we cannot refuse it purely on the basis that it's retrospective. I, sorry, I do understand that, but they make some reference to uh, one attempt to gain permission and then they make a second attempt. I, mean, I, I agree with everything you're saying. If somebody makes a retrospective, a retrospective planning application is not approved, uh, can they make a second retrospective planning application? That's, I'm, I'm reading that it's that way. I, OK, I understand now. So no, so substantially the same application cannot be submitted twice, whether it's retrospective or not. There has to be some, some substantial difference. Absolutely. Yeah, that's fine. Sorry. About that. Andrew? Anybody else who hasn't been to the site visit? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just look at this in a very simplistic view and again with a lot of sympathy for Mr Murphy. 
a condition was set on this original application, and presumably the condition was set with very good reason by the officers involved. The applicant has chosen not to conform to that condition, and I see no good reason why we should therefore agree the condition was wrong in the first place and should now be changed. There we go. Um, the, the condition that's referred to is obviously the approved plans condition and obviously a development that is not built in accordance with the approved plans by virtue of the fact that it does not accord, that condition needs to be varied. The question the committee needs to consider is whether the change between the approved plans and what is presented in front of us tonight is sufficiently harmful to refuse, not the principle of the change, but the fact we have an application in front of us for a 25 centimetre increase in a building, uh, a single storey row extension. The question the committee needs to, uh, to arrive at is whether that increase in height is harmful. If it is, then th they can make a, a decision accordingly. If it's not, Likewise. John. I just got one quick question. Um, this is application was submitted to you now. Would you approve it? Extension. As a, a normal application for this development? The, the fact, thank you. It's a very good question. The fact that the application is being recommended for approval as it is in its entirety is the council supporting the development as is proposed in front of us. But obviously it's not for the entire development because 95% of it is approved. So it is purely for the 5% and the conclusion the officer has made that the 5% plus the 95 is acceptable. We would. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? I guess we're going to. I was on the site visit, and I, ju I just can't conceive, having looked at it, that you know, to that height is terrible. Come down nine inches, it's suddenly perfectly okay. Just looking at it, it, it's such a small difference, and I can't see how one can be okay and the other can't. Obviously, if you go up further, then that might make a difference, but it's nine inches. It's a very small, very small distance. Yes, and Andrew? Yes, um, having listened very carefully to all of the comments that have been made tonight, um, I would like to um, uh, state my own um, um, uh, position on this. Um, I did um, you know, say that when I visited the site, I did feel that uh, the um, what was before us was overbearing. I appreciate that it's subjective. Um, I also appreciate um, you know, what um, um, uh, the comments that Councillor Bowering has just made um, you know, about um, what impact should there be a reduction in the height if there was, um, you know, that what uh, actual impact that might have, you know, on uh, the appearance um, of the site. I think Councillor Kaiser's um, uh, question and the response to that question is a very, very important um, uh, one um, indeed. Um, and in light of um, uh, those and other questions and comments tonight, I would like to uh, suggest that we um, uh, uh, that we go to a vote um, on this issue. Um, and uh, with your indulgence, Chair, I'd like to propose that we do um, um, uh, 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 propose that we uh, vote on accepting um, this um, uh, planning application. OK, let's go to a vote then. All those in favour of the application? Against? Abstentions?
Okay, we're going on to application number 220391, number 10 of the Landed Arborfield Garrison. So, um, thank you. The three Chair. brick bond ones have been deferred, withdrawn. Over to Nick. Over to Nick. Thank you, Chair. I'll be um, presenting the application this evening. I'm the, the case officer. Um, so, the application pertains to uh, a 1.3 hectare parcel of land shown here at Arborfield Garrison. The application seeks reserve matters approval pursuant to the outline planning permission, which is 02014-2280. The site was formerly part of the Arborfield Garrison and included a car park on the northern half, which has recently been, been reinstated as bare earth. Prior to its association with the garrison, uh, the use of the site uh, formed part of a nearby farm. This slide shows the Arborfield strategic um, development location. Both halves of the development, that's Arborfield Garrison to the north and Hogwood Farm to the south, benefit from outline planning commissions, totaling three and a half thousand dwellings. And these established the principle of development across the entire SDL. Development commenced in 2016 and is now well underway. The location of the current reserve matter site is shown here, edged red within the wider outline planning permission. Uh, the current application comprises details of 43 dwellings across Parcel P. Access is via Princess Marina Drive from an existing Bellmouth. That's shown on the right hand side of the plan here. A mix of two, three and four bedroom houses as well as two bedroom apartments are proposed in this application. In accordance with the Section 106 agreement, 21% of the dwellings on the site, that's nine units, will be affordable tenure. A financial contribution equivalent to a further 14% is to be provided towards off-site provision. Example street scene elevations are shown here. The layout features variation in building heights and architecture in accordance with the design code and outline parameters for this area of the outline planning permission site. Houses are either two or three storeys and a three-storey apartment block accommodates six flats. And this slide shows um, a few CGI images of uh, the proposed development. The layout complies well with the council standards in respect to separation distances and internal living space. All but two of the houses meet the minimum 11 metre threshold for garden length. And in these cases are generally mitigated through wider than average plots or the absence of a back to back relationship with a neighbouring property. The apartment units benefit from private balconies and communal gardens. The site is well separated from existing development and will not have a negative impact on residential amenity. The built form in conjunction with the landscaping scheme secured by condition will ensure that the development responds appropriately to the existing context. In terms of the highways layout, the site has been designed in accordance with the outline access strategy and street hierarchy uh, that has been established through the outline planning permission. The main site access, as mentioned, is via Princess Marina Drive to the right hand side here. The layout is permeable to pedestrians with an access provided to the site's boundary with Sheerlands Road and via the western area of public open space. Development is well served by existing bus services with stops conveniently located along Sheerlands Road at the site's western boundary. An average of 2.4 parking spaces per dwelling is provided across the site. The proposals meet the council standards, will not result in an unacceptable impact on the local highway network and are therefore acceptable in highways terms. So in conclusion, the development complies with the council's policies and standards and it's considered to be high quality design. It's therefore recommended that the application be approved subject to the conditions set out in the committee report. OK, any questions? From speakers. Any speakers? Mr. Poggy uh, is going to be on Teams. Yep, I'm here. <clears throat> Thank you. 
uh, residents from both the new dwellings and the older dwellings uh, have objected to the application for the same underlying reasons. And that is the concern with the lack of anticipated infrastructure and facilities. This refers mainly to the lack of progress for the, on the district center, the linear parks, alternative green spaces, allotments and sporting facilities. One of the conditions for the approval is that nothing shall be deemed to affect or vary the conditions imposed by the Regional Planning Permission 0214-2280 dated April 2015. Yet, the Northern uh, uh, Neighbourhood Centre has not materialised and is now used as a Chris Nicholson sales office. Two numerous conditions related to the green infrastructure with requirements to submit phasing plans have not been adhered to. The linear area from the stables to the land uh, to the lake should have been landscaped years ago. In February, a newsletter from Working and Borough Council stated that the park near the lake would open this summer. Nothing has happened. The lead developer should have refurbished the sports fields and pavilion and made them available for use according Office. to the triggers in section mm. 106 agreement. Triggers have long since passed, and yet we have still to see any progress there. The point I make is commitments to the community are continuously broken, and the committee is repeat, community is repeatedly being misled. What possible faith can the community have in the council or the developers that the district centre will materialise, that the sport pitches and pavilion will be a reality, and that the alternative green space and linear parks will be completed? The district centre application is expected to be submitted later in 2022 with the delivery in phases starting 2023-24. Based on previous commitments on the same and the history of phased application, this statement does not spell success. How is the council going to generate the re uh, guarantee the residents that the timeline will be adhered to? I would like to request that the application is deferred until some of the significant infrastructures that are outstanding, as mentioned on page 116 of the uh, report, are undertaken. Or if indeed it is approved, that they are that is approved with specific conditions, namely the plans are submitted for approval for the uh, for the district centre, all within specific time limits. Linear parks are completed as originally intended. Same for the sports fields within sp uh, specific time limits. Uh, council puts in place measures to monitor progress against these timelines. Could a you please summarise your time? Is will, just about a reasonable up. start date and end date for each project is agreed and non-compliance is dealt with appropriately. The current uh, site allocated the district centre is clear of rubble and made to look more inviting and less like a dump site. Finally, the application falls within the village uh, green character area, parcel C, so we'd like to believe that the relevant planning history will be adhered to. Here I refer to application 212104, which deals with linear parks, community or orchards, the use of infirmary uh, stables thank you. and so thank on. You. Thank Would, you. Can you please uh, stop, please? Thank you. John? Um, the agent now. Okay. Michelle, Michelle the agent. Sorry. Good evening, councillors. My name is Michelle Kwan and I'm from Boyer, the planning consultants representing Taylor Wimpy, who are the applicant. Many of you will be familiar with the Arborfield Garrison site, which was granted outline planning permission in 2015 for a mixed use of development, including 2,000 new homes and supporting infrastructure. Taylor Wimpy acquired Parcel P, a 1.31 hectare parcel within the Arborfield Garrison site from Cress Nicholson in October 2021. Cress Nicholson remain the primary development delivery partner for Arborfield Garrison and are responsible for the delivery of the wider site and the surrounding infrastructure. As such, Taylor Wimpy will be solely responsible for the delivery of Parcel P. The application before you seeks reserve matters approval for 43 high quality new homes ranging in size and type from two bedroom apartments to four bedroom houses. The proposals include nine affordable homes, which ensures that the provision of affordable housing complies with the Section 106 requirements for the development. We have worked hard with your officers to ensure that the Reserve Matters Scheme before you is compliant with local plan policies and meets the aspirations of the associated design code. The development incorporates a variety of house types, materials and architectural details to provide interest and variation. All dwellings also meet or exceed national space standards. 
The application provides car parking provision in line with your adopted parking standards and includes both visitor and unallocated parking spaces. The proposals also incorporate capacity for electric vehicle charging points for each property, as well as communal charging points. Furthermore, the proposals also include the planting of 55 new trees, as well as new hedgerows, and have been carefully designed to retain all of the existing trees on site. Additionally, the development incorporates a number of ecological enhancements, including bat and bird boxes, hedgehog highways and bee bricks, which are distributed throughout the development. In accordance with the requirements of the Outline Planning Commission, the development will achieve a 10% reduction in carbon emissions beyond the minimum building regulations requirements. This will be achieved through a range of measures, including the installation of PV panels. Following detailed consultation with officers and stakeholders, we are delighted that officers have recommended this Reserve Matters application for approval. We hope members will support our proposals and look forward to building upon the success of the wider development and making a valuable contribution to the delivery of much needed, high quality, new private and affordable homes within the borough. We therefore respectfully request that you support your officer's recommendation to grant Reserve Matters approval. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Okay, this time, John. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the, this Arborfield Garrison is a bit of a known because 85% uh, of it sits in Barkham. Um, I am disappointed with the fact that Crest haven't delivered the services that they should have done. Um, they've obviously made the point that COVID has been around for two years, but that's not necessarily true. We managed to deliver a school, a secondary school, a substantial piece of infrastructure in the way of the of the, the bypass, so they could have done it. But I can't see how a planning application, which is deemed to be acceptable, which is reserved matters on a site which is um, already got planning permission, how we can use that to pressure another developer, who is Crest. Um, we are working with Crest. I would like to see the officers working a bit harder with Crest because I do think um, some of the stuff we've done and we're now beginning to see that some of the money put aside isn't sufficient to cover some of the things and that, that we were hoping would be delivered and that's partly due to the cost increases. But I do think that the playing fields are on, they do seem to be on track to be delivered, albeit late. Um, we have now at least got communication with Crest with regards to the delivery of the community centre. They've decided to use an existing building, which is the old lecture theatre, which is a good use of that facility. It's quite a nice facility and it means that uh, that will get delivered quicker than it would have been if it was built from the ground up. But I can't see how we can use Taylor Wimpy's application as a pressure point for Chris Nicholson, to be honest with you. Thank you. Yeah, again, uh, being involved with this from day one, along with John, um, I uh, support him 100 percent, um, because in a way, what, what the implication of the uh, uh, the other inputs have been um, uh, was really to use Taylor Wimpy to blackmail Crest into delivering a, a community facility, which they've already said they will. Um, within the next two years, the planning application will come in late later this year. Um, John and I have argued along the line that we needed it sooner, but there are commercial pressures. Uh, at what point? does a, a, a recognised supermarket and other shopping facilities want to come into into a community area? And I'm, I, we're, we're, we both regret that it's, it's not there already, but there may be commercial pressures why that's the reason. But to refuse um, 43 houses um, won't bring the community centre any faster. So refusing 43 houses does absolutely nothing to the plan. All you're doing is you're doing away with 43 houses that people can come and live in in our community. So it, it's really it's not a it's not a very good idea. Um, nine affordable houses, um, uh, planting trees and hedges. Um, there's a new road coming through which looks as if it'll take pressure off the existing part of the existing Shearlands Road. 
and Baird Road. Um, there's a, a bus that runs right by the front of the estate, so the, it, it will be on, 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 the, on the bus route. Um, uh, car parking standards are reasonable, uh, electric charging points and PV panels on some of the houses. They're, they're doing everything right. And in a way, I think it would be uh, uh, very naive of us to turn that down in the hopes that it would make the community centre come quicker. In actual fact, it would do quite the opposite and make it come slower. So I'm fully supportive of this and I will, I will be supporting it. David? <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to echo Gary and John's comments, uh, you know, speaking on behalf of Finch Hampstead. Um, I'd like to see this development built out as quickly as possible. We need the housing numbers and we need the housing um, and we shouldn't do anything to delay it. But I do share the intense frustration that's being voiced by increasing numbers of residents about the lack of provision of infrastructure. And we ignore that at our peril. Um, this comes back to this question of democratic mandate. Um, if people feel they're not being listened to, then they will act appropriately. And we've seen that in the elections in May. Um, we do need to find some means of putting some pressure on a more rapid delivery of the community centre and the other assets. We talk about sustainable development in the core policies of the council, but without those assets in place, there are large chunks in the sustainability of this development. People have to use their cars currently to go shopping. Um, Gary makes an excellent point as to the officers in their report about commercial viability of uh, attracting retailers in. I feel there are more imaginative solutions that could be put in place, even as a short term measure. Um, there are independent retailers. We've seen plenty of examples around the borough of people using innovative approaches to new retail services. So I think we are um, we're not being as imaginative in trying to bring this forward as we could be. And I think it's important to do that because we do need to recognise the concerns being voiced by our residents. But on the whole, I, I fully support this plan should go ahead and we'd be very foolish to hold it up as a protest. Can the officer could comment on whether we can actually pressure anybody to deliver these facilities sooner? Well, I would just make the point that officers including myself, are working um, very closely with Crest now to, to bring these plans forward. We've, we've got a number of uh, dates in the diary for, for further pre-app meetings. We've all already seen um, engagement with, uh, with the local community through a, a public exhibition, which was held uh, last month. Um, that we're looking to get to bring this forward as soon as we as we possibly can as our Crest. It's vitally important however that what we bring forward is the right development that it's not rushed this needs to stand the test of time um, and it needs to be a commercial success and that that does involve a, a process where we need to, to go through um, in terms of pre-app and engagement to make sure that, that the scheme is is fit for purpose and and works so um as an officer of the council, I really do share the um, the, the frustration of residents. Um, but what I would say is we are simply just looking to get this um, through the right scheme through as fast as we possibly can. Um, and I, I, I do think um, Crest would like to as well, um, but they have had um, difficulty until now attracting um, a, a supermarket operator that would be the key anchor tenant in the district centre. But they do now have interest from, um, from from an anchor tenant to take on a tenancy uh, for, the, for the supermarket building. This is um, of vital importance and is what is really driving things forward now. So I really do see that there's light at the end of the tunnel for this. Um, as we can bring forward a viable scheme for, for the district centre, Crest will bring forward a viable scheme for the district centre. And um, it's just one last push and a little bit longer and we will start to see spades in the ground. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, obviously, this is the daily Wimpy application that we're considering this evening, and uh, I understand why there's been a lot of discussion about the Crest um, uh, infrastructure not having been delivered, but uh, I think we must focus on this particular application. Uh, as John already said, this is uh, a reserved matters application. The outline planning consent's already been given. Uh, so what we should be focusing on 
now, as far as I can see, is access, appearance, landscaping, layout and scale. Um, Nick, could you possibly put up again those street scene um, elevations you had? Uh, because I don't think they're actually in the agenda and, and obviously they're quite helpful to see from our point of view in just assuring ourselves that we're happy with the house styles and how they fit together in this development. Yeah. Nick, Nick can you maximise the slideshow so it fills the screen, please? Um. It's maximised on my screen. Um, Don't worry, I can see Zima. Um, so they're all either three or two and a half storey. Not sure how you categorise them. Yeah, between two and 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 three storey. Some are three. Some are proper three storeys. Yeah. Um, I I don't have any particular concerns about design features I don't in some ways they look quite attractive mm. spaced out um, so I, I think that's fine thank you I'm, I'm quite content to approve this given that we are at the stage of reserve matters Chris well it's probably some very helpful but I mean if there's a, a dependency uh, for the district center for parcel P why, why is there no uh, condition to say the district centre should be built even if partially before a certain number of uh, houses are occupied. Different developers, I believe. Different developers. There are conditions attached to the, the outline planning permission, um, which, which do go into the phasing to, to some extent. And I, I can comment on those if members would like me to. Um, however, I, I would just refer back to the, the points that have already been made about the, you know, what we're considering this evening, which is which is the reserve matters um, of the outline, um, um, and um, con consideration of the phasing is sort of a, a separate question, really, to the the question of whether or not this application itself is is acceptable. I just wanted to say one other thing, which really doesn't relate to this plan application, but part of the frustration at Arborfield Green, and we officers need to take this on board and we need to seriously think about how we deal with this, is the community interest companies. They charge three or four hundred pounds a year. That looks like it goes up every year. And that really is what annoys the residents because they feel they're paying us rates and they're also paying rates to the, the developer. And of course, on top of that, the developer insults them by not delivering the infrastructure. I mean, we've done our bit, we've done the road, we've done the school, and I really do think wherever we can make put pressure on developers for to stop them putting in these community interest companies because they are just a way of making money or avoiding paying the council. At one stage, they wanted to put the drains in it, unbelievably. We need to make sure wherever we can, if we have the ability, is to stop this happening on these major developments. It causes nothing but heartache for us councillors and the residents who live on these sites. Could that please be minuted, the information? I understand what you're talking about because it's quite common in a lot of the new development sites. No yes. Just yes. Pay your SIL money, your S106 money and your affordable housing and we will do it. We'd like to see them all be. Okay. okay. Uh, there's an application before us. Please vote on for approval or. It's unanimous. Okay. The next three applications have been withdrawn and we're going on to application two, two, one. 007, 
Uh, 302 London Road, Woking. Thank you, Chair. Um, Nick, can you um, remove your screen, please? The application is for a single story rear extension, side and rear extension to an existing um, vet practice in London Road and Workium. Involves uh, additional uh, dog kennel space and end of care room. Um, the site plan here with parking at the front and the rear. Um, the extension is the, the side bit you can see there and extending from the rear to the rear. Uh, it's in elevation form, the bottom elevation being the view from the neighbouring property. Could you please show the slides? Uh, sorry, I thought I was. My apologies. Is that better? Yes, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so the site plan here with parking at the front and the rear. Uh, the extension here is to the side and to the rear of the building there, as you can see along the back there. Uh, this is the view from the neighbouring property on the bottom side, single storey extension. Um, and you, the aerial view here, you'll see the, the car park to the front and the rear. Um, the property is slightly shorter than the rest of the properties in the area. Um, this is a photo of the car park at the rear. This is the, the relationship to the neighbouring property to the side. Uh, this is the location of the extension. And that's looking back from the extension where the extension will be back towards the rear boundary. Uh, final photo here is from this uh, a view from the street. So there were two resonant objections, one from the neighbouring property at 304 concerned about um, neighbour amenity impact, primarily the um, dominance of the extension and noise from dogs barking um, and a neighbour from the rear across the rear boundary. Um, out in Woodrow Drive, which was uh, raised overlooking concerns amongst others. Um, th there's no primary objection to what's being proposed. Um, the flooding impacts are acceptable. Parking is acceptable to the highways officer. Um, the character issues are acceptable. Um, landscaping, I'll just refer back to this photo here. The landscaping that was proposed in a 2015 application for the conversion to the vets hasn't or has died in the interim period and uh, a condition has been imposed on this application to, to ensure that it is implemented as part of this application. Uh, the subject to those conditions in the report, the application is recommended for approval. Thank you. Anybody like? No, there's no public speakers, so it's going to. Anybody like to speak? Comments? Um, Merely to say that this seems like a very modest application. Uh, I, I can't see it causing material harm, and I'm very happy to support it. And unless anyone is of the contrary view, I think we might be able to vote on this fairly quickly. Gary? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm just curious how long it's been a vet, that's all. Um, I, I'm quite willing to go along with Stephen and support it, but I'm just interested is because uh, the the reasons for uh, listed by the members was acoustic and visible privacy, loss of light, and somebody mentions dogs barking. So I mean, it's been a vet for a X number of years. Then one would expect to have dogs barking anyway. But I agree with Stephen; it's a fairly modest application, and I'm quite happy to support it. Okay, let's go to the vote. Would you like to reply to Gary, Simon? Uh, the mission is from 2018. Uh, the Environmental Health Officer has indicated there's been no objections or no complaints received in that period in relation to noise from dogs. OK, let's go to a vote then. All those in favour? Unanimous. Unanimous. The next application is double two double zero three four Lambs Farm Swallowfield. Is my 
Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Unfortunately, my video isn't working. Apologies, tonight. apologies, Ian. Sorry. Um, we need to hear from the officer first, and then we'll come to the no, public speaking. Apologies. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so this is application double two double zero three four. This is for three additional business units within Lambs Farm Business Park, Swallowfield, for additional vehicle parking and ancillary works. Here is a location plan showing the three units highlighted, and I have also produced an aerial photograph showing the access and roughly showing the access and the three new proposed units. As you would see, um, the three additional units would be cited amongst the existing units within the business park. Um, just to the north of the access is the settlement of Spencer's Wood. Um, another business park is cited here, and this is also the location of a primary school, Lambs Lane Primary School. Um, here is a additional site plan showing the parking provisions for the entire site and showing the three proposed units highlighted in red. First unit is proposed unit M4. This is proposed to be sited um, adjacent to unit L on the southeastern boundary. Um, each unit is roughly 100 square foot of floor space. And as you can see from the elevation plans here for proposed unit M4, um, the heights of the units are approximately 5.8, so they do not exceed six overall, uh, six meters in height, and they match the existing, their design match the existing units within the business park. Um, this is proposed unit N5. Again, it's situated along the southeastern boundary and um, in close proximity to unit N and saw here, also known as units Q2, Q3. It is highlight its location is highlighted here on existing hard standing. Um, these are the elevations and also the floor plan for proposed unit N5. Again, similar design and similar height and mass. Uh, finally, this is proposed unit J2. This is the slightly bigger of the three proposed units. Um, it's got a square foot floor space proposed as 150 approximately, no, meter square, sorry. And um, it would so be situated on what is currently a parking area and adjacent to unit J. Here are, um, here's a sectional plan, a floor plan, and also the elevations, again, the same design pretty much. And to conclude, the proposal is acceptable in respect of impacts on the countryside, impact on the local highway network and impact on neighbouring immunity. Um, issues related to landscape, ecology and drainage can be mitigated through conditions. Uh, yeah. Therefore, the proposal is acceptable in principle and is recommended for approval subject to the conditions indicated at the start of the report. Thank you. OK. Uh, and the next speaker will be Ian Fullerton from Swallowfield Parish Council. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Uh, apologies, my video isn't working this evening, so hopefully my voice will suffice. Um, my name is Ian Fullerton, and I'm here to present the views of Swallowfield Parish Council in connection with application 22034 by Winkworth for a further increase in building and commercial activities at Lambs Farm Business Park in Spencer's Wood. The committee will be aware, I'm sure, of the inexorable increase in business activities, building construction and land use by this enterprise over the last 20 years, and the succession of planning applications in support of that growth. Whilst the Parish Council recognises and supports the applicant's contribution to the rural economy and local employment, there comes a point when the growing intrusion of this otherwise erstwhile development becomes unsustainable for the local community and a threat to the safety and well-being of neighbouring residents. Now, we accept reports that the local road network can cope with the incremental traffic and the manoeuvring space on the site is sufficient. Our principal concern relates to the proximity of the site to Lambs Lane Primary School, which is situated a short distance from the site entrance on Back Lane. From the school's perspective, current traffic levels are already excessive and there is considerable anxiety among parents about the risks to their children. 
Lands Lake Primary School is open and active from early morning until late afternoon, starting with a preschool breakfast club, continuing through to after school clubs and sport. The catchment area for this school is such that parents and children not only use back lane and pavements immediately opposite the site entrance to walk children to and from school, but also to drop off and collect by car children living further away. A number of back lane residents also have small children using the pavements, including at least two households directly opposite the site entrance, a fact misrepresented in the original application. Traffic entering or leaving the site inevitably re represents a physical threat to pedestrians and other road users, not to mention the more subtle threat of noxious fumes from vehicle exhausts. We all know that children can be unpredictable at times. An incident involving a child and a motor vehicle can only be a matter of time. We therefore submit that vehicle movements in back lane during school hours need to be reduced, not increased, even marginally. A passing thought. Would any of you offer the excuse to the grieving parents of an injured child that it was only a small increment in road traffic? Please put yourself in their position before considering your response. Finally, while it may be argued that this application represents only a small increment to business on the site and associated traffic, when will or should this incremental growth end? What is there to stop the next application and the one after that? For yet further growth in buildings, expansion into agricultural land and traffic. The parish council submits that enough is enough. Now is the time to stop and we therefore strongly oppose the application. Thank you. The next speaker is Roderick Vaughn, a resident. Okay, can you see me and hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair, I I'll begin. Tonight, uh, I'm representing the views of residents in Back Lane and Lambs Lane, and will give reasons why the application for more development at this location should be refused. The business park was established in 1998. Since then, around 35 planning applications have been approved to further develop within this expanding curtilage. Development has been relentless and the site has expanded from half a hectare to over four hectares today. This is an eight-fold increase to the area of buildings and hard standing. The site operates 24-7, 365 days a year. Its entrance is approximately 50 metres from the junction of Back Lane with the B3349 to the east and a similar distance from the local primary school to the west. Already a lot has been mentioned about the school, so I shall move on. There are two residential properties directly opposite, and again, they've been ignored in plan this particular planning applications and others before. And further along on the north side of Lambs Lane, past the school, plus a random distribution along Lambs Lane to the south towards the River Loddon. I'd like you to note the business park is located in the rural parish of Swallowfield and is not in a designated area for major development. Expansion in this sensitive countryside location has continued even after the council advised in 2012 there was only scope for limited further development. In 2016, it was stated the site was fully developed when a proposal to build towards Lambs Lane to the west was refused at appeal. Expansion under the pretext of limited further development has become, I'm afraid, deeply flawed. That is my opinion. The cumulative negative impacts on the environment, on highway safety, on the local amenity, and on the need for any development to be sustainable are all now being ignored. The proposal also conflicts with a number of the Council's planning policies. Take the policies covering sustainable development. Drainage provided by circuits are inadequate. A runoff does occur. There is no contribution to net zero carbon in the absence of solar panels on buildings. Moving on to general principles of development, there has been a massing of the built form on the site. Tenants have objected to this application on the grounds of high building density and reduced areas for manoeuvring. And on to scale and location of developments. Attempts at public examination have in the past been unsuccessful to have the site listed as a core employment area to smooth the way for strategically planned development. Development here is, I'm afraid, unplanned and without any community engagement. 
outside development limits and in the countryside. Yes, rural enterprise is an exception, but it must be sustainable. Four additional jobs do not offset could the you, negative could you, impact. Could you please sum up your time? Of more development. But finally, the national planning policy framework in paragraph 83 states that planning policies and decisions should enable the sustainable growth and expansion of all types of businesses in rural areas. Carte plans to any rural employment development is not permitted. It needs to be sustainable. Simply put, these means actions taken today should not impact badly on others tomorrow. It is not sustainable and should therefore be refused. Thank you for listening and sorry for speeding up. The next speaker will be Christopher Howe. Um, Good evening, Chair, members. The applicant, J.P. Winkworth Limited, is a private, family-owned business that has established and managed Lambs Farm Business Park for more than 20 years. The business park has proved to be extensively popular in meeting the needs of small businesses for high-quality space with the flexibility to expand in accordance with the requirements of their business. The occupiers are predominantly local businesses employing local people and run by owners or managers who live within five miles of the site. For those of you who do not know it, the main features that make this business park such a success are meticulous maintenance of the site, high level of security, including CCTV, security fencing and gates, together with lighting, close access to the M4 motorway, a good local pool of labour, and a spacious layout and approachable management style with on-site management from an estate office. There is a strong demand for employment space of this type, which is small scale and high caliber. It is an asset to the economy and profile of the borough. Unlike many other industrial estates, Lambs Farm Business Park currently enjoys 100% occupancy rate, which is usually the case, and any vacancies that do arise are quickly met from inquiries arising from an advertising board placed on the Basingstoke Road frontage. It is against this background of the government's support for economic growth, which is particularly supportive of local businesses, that this application should be determined. The business park has grown incrementally over the years within its site and in accordance with planning policy and to manage development costs of new buildings. The application before you today is for three small commercial units totaling 340 metres square with low ridge heights. Questions raised by third parties and the Parish Council are fully addressed in the officer's report, but most importantly, the site lies adjacent to the settlement of Spencer's Wood and is previously developed land. The proposed units would be viewed in the context of the existing massive buildings within the business park and would not be incongruous or clearly visible outside it. Traffic generation and parking provision have been carefully considered by the highway officer and found to be satisfactory. The development proposal is therefore small scale, will have no material impact on the countryside, and your highways officer considers parking provision to be acceptable. Furthermore, they also take the view that no unacceptable risk or harm has been identified in respect of highway safety. This is a sustainable development proposal that accords with development plan policies and no overriding adverse impacts have been identified. In these difficult economic times, development projects such as this, which promote the national and local economy, should be supported and members are respectfully requested to accept their officer's recommendation and grant planning permission tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Stuart, somewhere you're on there someplace, I think. I'm here. Good evening, Chair. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Um, a lot of the points that I'm going to make have been already made by my local um, residents. 
uh, and by the Swarthfield Parish Council, who, of course, both of which I, I totally support. I've lived um, near this site for 36 years, and what started as a very small little farm building has turned into something that, quite frankly, just grows and grows and grows. So I'm going to restrict my comments to four or five things. Firstly, I don't list things for the, the committee to look at lightly. I'm here, there's so much local resistance to this burgeoning sort of development into the countryside that it has to be considered. Um, I think inspectors' decisions about there was no need and that, and that quite frankly, it's not necessary. It's, it's absolutely true because actually it just gets slightly, a little nibble, 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 bigger, bigger, bigger. The proximity of the school has been mentioned. The school is a very successful school, Lowndes Lane School. And in fact, there's so much worry about the HGV traffic that there is a project in the highways department to consider restricting the traffic from the north to the builders merchants only to the builders merchants and from the south to the business park only and not to allow it to traverse the school so that will tell you that actually the highways department do have some concerns about the, the traffic bypassing the school um finally it can be seen from the, the planning history that this is just you know one thing after another it just goes on for 20 years it just went on and on and on the lack of need of capacity was what the, what the inspector said today the site was was it's in the countryside and it started as a few farm buildings of, as, as I think Mr. Mr. Vaughan said, of half a hectare. Today it's four hectares and growing. You've seen the, 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 the aerial view. That's an 800% increase. When will this stop? It's reasonable to assume that more applications will appear, whatever the outcome of this is, and that they will continue to encroach into the countryside by a school. So I would say that the committee, having seen some of this evidence, you know, enough is enough. So I agree with the parish council, and I would urge the committee to stop this encroachment over the countryside and and and, and worry about the children in Lands Lane School crossing this road, and therefore refuse this application as previous inspectors have done. Thank you for listening to me. Members, any? Um, thank you very much. Uh, Chair, um, there seem to be two fundamental issues here for us to try and uh, grapple with. Um, the first is our old friend highways. Um, clearly a lot of concerns about traffic generation on the site and the impact particularly on the neighbouring school. Um, as as uh, I said in relation to an earlier application this evening, the difficulty we have in in, in taking that any further is is very clearly that we have the advice of a technical officer who's assessed this in the highways department who tells us it's acceptable. Um, the second uh, point is is the, the extent to which this is uh, not compliant with CP11 uh, and it constitutes an encroachment in the countryside. It's clearly beyond uh, settlement. Uh, and here, I guess it's a balanced judgment again, our, another one of our old friends. Um, it's outside development limits, but on page 320, Section six, it, it's clear that there are, there are two exceptions that are relevant here. First is uh, the extent to which it contributes to diverse and sustainable rural enterprises within the borough. And the second is the extent to which it uh, would not lead to excessive encroachment or expansion of development away from the original buildings. And the report seeks to, to to address both of those exceptions. Um, there isn't any clear definition of what a rural enterprise is, but the, the officer judgment is that this is this constitutes an appropriate exemption on that basis. And the other uh, uh, part of it, which I, I found the most uh, interesting, and I would like to know a little bit more from the officer and Marcus, if you could tell us a little bit more about this, um, how he came to the judgment that this didn't represent um, an excessive encroachment beyond or significantly away from the original buildings. That seems to be a key issue here, and I would welcome Marcus perhaps 
expanding on his comments in the report to, to give us a sense of of whether um, on what grounds he thinks that this is acceptable in planning terms. Yes, of course. So um, I would just firstly just clarify that um, the three units are represent um, sort of a, a li further limited development of the site within the existing constraints of the site. So um, in terms of the judgment on why it doesn't represent excessive encroachment, um, the planning history does play a bit of a part in this. Um, and if you look back at the original um, plans, but also what we have here today, um, towards the east of the site has been considered and is still considered today um, close um, within enough close proximity of the original farm buildings on the site that it doesn't represent an excessive encroachment. Um, I'm, I would also just add um, that reference has been made to an appeal decision from 2016 uh, relating to application reference 162594, which is within the planning history section of the report. Um, that and a couple of other refuse applications were relating to development towards the west of the sites where there are open fields, whereas here within the southeastern corner of the site is where the boundaries are and where the existing units, which have already been deemed acceptable in principle in countryside terms, these buildings would sit alongside them and that is why, that is how the judgment was made. And I'd also add about, about the MPPF talking about the need for previously developed land to be considered when talking about countryside. Um, that is paragraph, excuse me, 80. Um, as defined previous land, sorry, as land which is or was occupied by a permanent structure, including the curtilage of the developed land. And I, from looking at the site plans and the other and the other material considerations, I would say that these bills, proposed buildings, sit comfortably amongst the existing buildings and are within the curtilage of the site. So, so if I may just um, pursue that a little bit further, Marcus. So. Uh, your your argument is that um, because these new buildings are on the eastern edge and they're not close to the open countryside and they are in relatively close proximity to the original farm buildings, they're acceptable. So does that mean there would come a point when further um, applications to try and expand the site further towards the western boundary and the open countryside would be unacceptable? Um, so, of course, any future application would need to be determined on its own merits, as this one is. But I would say that it's with the historically with the planning history side of things and um, the way the inspector indicated in 2016 on other occasions as well that we have been indicated towards the west is veering towards the open fields. And whilst the eastern edge has already been identified as acceptable for these business units, and um, that is the established use of the land. And the, if, for example, the new units would result in a boundary change or the boundary shifting into the open field next door, then yes, I would consider that a clear encroachment into the countryside. But where we are today with the existing boundaries of the business park, I would say that this is within the business park and any additional units within this side of the business park wouldn't be an encroachment. Um, I hope that's clear. Sorry. No, it is clear. Thank you. The reason I'm raising the issue is because clearly there is a lot of concern about incremental development and this not being the last we'll see and there'll be much more to come and this will keep going on and on and on. But there is, in a sense, a clear limit to what can be done on this site uh, if it's going to comply with the exception to CP11. Um, if it starts to move too far away from the original farm buildings, that will become grounds for saying this is unacceptable, whereas uh, your judgment is at the moment this is acceptable. Um, I think I'm summarising your position. 
correctly. Yeah, that, yeah, I think that's the correct way of thank you. Uh, yeah, I've, I've, um, oh, sorry. Um, I, I, I know the site um, from many years ago. I'm not sure if it was the um, uh, we conducted the Southeast Plan public inquiry there, um, or was it the court strategy? I can't remember. Anyway, it, was, it was well over 10, 12 or more years ago, and there were not so many buildings there now. And when I go to Swallowfield, I do drive down the Basingstoke Road, so I do go past it, and it's it's fairly. Um, you can see the, the restriction in the site and the number of uh, green buildings within it. It's, it's just, it stands out, and obviously up Sand Lane, you've got where the site access is, um, is where there's the big builders' merchants at the top and the school. Um, Stephen picked up on the main points in a way, and and and, and I'd written down here limits to development, and in a way, if if you if you considered it as a red line site, probably what uh, what's being proposed is a limit to the development within the site. I I can't see there being any more room, and then Stephen did pick up on contribution to diverse references, and the M MPPF talking about put it. Um, uh, planning balance and, and again should there be no plans future plans or a recognition that it can't extend to the west into the countryside well, then I'd be comfortable with going along with this planning application yeah just one one question Marcus Marcus is he still there uh, yeah all right do, do you think that this additional development on the site will force vehicles off the site to park in surrounding streets? Um, so I would refer to the access and movement section of the report, mostly on page 324, uh, where there is a lot of, um, I've, I've included quotes and uh, a lot of statements from the highways officer who assessed the scheme. And um, he has said quite clearly in paragraph 26 that um, due to there only being a proposed increase of 340 square metres of employment space, the highest level trips would be 528 trips in both the AM and PM peaks. And he has then we then go on to paragraph 28 where so initially um, we, we, so the council asked for additional information on the parking provisions of the site and the applicant submitted a parking provision site plan clarifying that there would be 333 parking spaces um, on the site on the, within the business park as a whole following the following the implementation of this development. So um, I would say following the highways officer's advice, I would say is extremely unlikely that there would be any off-road parking, especially um, with HGVs. Um, I'd also add that the proposed units themselves are quite significantly away from the access point, so that would be a long journey walking time from the access point of on back lane to these new units. Um, so I, following the highways officer's advice, I would say it's extremely unlikely and there is not enough harmful there's not enough risk of this taking place and that's where the harm would be i hope that's clear john just to just to quickly add to that as well back lane, back lane has um it has already quite a fair section of wl lines and obviously the zigzags outside the school and that's uh mostly around the entrance to this business park so again it would push uh, some any any parking that was obviously you know considering to park out there uh, uh, make it further for them to have to walk to the business park, which again would kind of discourage it from happening. There is a fair bit of space on site, um, which obviously, you know, there's the long access road as well, which obviously it doesn't appear to be utilised um, from the, the site's been visited by by officers. Uh, and, and, and that's that's really what I can say. I mean, I, I heard what Stuart mentioned earlier. I, I can't comment on that. That's not something that we could link to the planning application at the moment, but if that's what officers are looking at in traffic management side of highways then obviously that would help to um, to address this further as well and I think just to highlight um, you know it is unfortunate if accidents are to take place 
Uh, luckily, I think in this situation, we do, especially around schools when schemes come in, we do have a good consideration check road safety uh, information. And in this in this instance, uh, the, the the officers look back for the last 10 years and there's only been one slight accident which only involved a car uh, on that section of road. Um, and you know, I just wish that was the case outside many, many other schools across the, the country. Uh, and I think luckily Lambs Lane School as well, which as Stuart's mentioned is a very good school, uh, does have the facility which a number of schools across the borough don't don't have, which is the the, the very decent pick up and drop off uh, on the opposite side of the carriageway with a zebra crossing leading to the school, uh, which helps to kind of keep parents off that section of road as well, which helps you keep it clear and helps them obviously utilise the, the parking pick up and drop off. David? Yeah. Could I ask um, if the speed limit in Lambs Lane, sorry, in the uh, back lane, isn't 20 mile an hour already, would that be a consideration to reduce it as to that level, which is common under it by a number of school sites across the borough and may do something to alleviate uh, the, the perceived risk to children? Um, I was just having a quick look. I, I, I can't recall. Uh, I know the council implemented a couple of years back now the 20 mile an hour flashing advisory signs outside nearly all the schools in the borough. Uh, if this one hasn't got one, then obviously that's something that the traffic management team can look into, um, but obviously couldn't be secured as part of this application because it's a separate process. Um, in terms of changing it to 20 mile an hour all the time, it, it, it's a very hard thing to change something down to 20 miles an hour. Uh, it needs physical measures to help restrict it. Uh, and when you try to do those types of measures, it, it's not really that easy for obviously the, the usage that will be currently using that, such as HDVs. And then it comes down to an enforcement aspect, and that comes down to enforcement of the speed limit by the police. Um, I, I can't comment on whether they will be uh, enforcing it or not. Um, we have many areas of the borough that you know, we, we would like them to do more enforcement, but obviously it's not so easy for us to uh, get them to do that. It's not something we can do, unfortunately. Wait, can I come back on that, please? That was a bit of a woolly answer. Um, there are a number of school locations across the borough where there are 20 mile an hour speed limits. I could list a few of them if it would help you. Um, but very specifically, would you as a council officer consider making a recommendation for that to be a 20 mile an hour limit in that road to help alleviate the concerns of residents and parents? The enforcement of it is clearly a separate issue and a matter for the police. Yeah, yeah. I, it's, I, I don't have enough data in front of me to recommend that that be a 20 mile hour permanently. Um, I don't disagree that in front of the schools, it should be an advisory 20 mile hour with the flashing Felicia beacons that they have outside the schools. Uh, and it may already have some out here. As I say, the, the council implemented them outside a lot of the schools. I think nearly all the schools, it was a, it was a rolled out across the borough a few years back. So if it's not one that's there, then it's, it's definitely something that, um, that I think should be considered or implemented. Oh, actually, that is there from looking at the sign that that yes, just, just to jump in there, Chris. Uh, so this is the entrance onto back lane from Basingstoke Road, um, which is the main ent entrance. And then so you come up here and this is the um, other business park on um, off of back lane. You come up. These are the signs, the flashing signs here. And then the in entrance to Lamb's Farm Business Park is on your left here. Yeah. And then the school is further up the road. Thanks for confirming that, Marcus. I wasn't sure the 20s were there. OK, if there's no further questions, does anyone want to put any recommendations? No? Go straight to the officer recommendation. Go straight to the officer recommendation uh, on page 309 for conditional approval. All those in favour? Unanimous. That's unanimous. This application, I'm going to stand down for because unfortunately, I've been the person listing it discussed it with me uh, before I became chair. So uh, I'm going to step down from it.
OK, if we could move on now, please. Uh, we're in a rather unusual situation in which we're going to um, consider two applications together. Uh, they both pertain to the same property, 220825 and 220826. Um, the, I will ask um, the case officer to explain uh, the reasoning, the reason for having the two applications, why there will be one presentation, um, why uh, speakers uh, will speak to both applications and will be given additional time uh, should they wish um, in order to do so. However, uh, we will vote separately on each of those applications. So good evening, uh, Tarek, is it? No, who's the case officer? Yes, Tarek. Tarek, yeah. Thank you. Could <coughs> the lady Please put her camera off, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, everyone. Um, this presentation will address both the householder and listed building consent uh, for the proposed development at 39 Terrace. Um, in both schemes, the uh, proposal is identical. Um, the scheme involves the installation of a glazed torrent spiral staircase, new terrace and lawns and stone paved into the rear garden area. If I just bring this up on the screen. and other associated works as shown on the slide. So here's an aerial image of the application site, uh, which is located on the northern side of the Terrace Road, which is set back from Reading Road and is opposite Shoot N. Here's the proposed block plan. If you can see my cursor, the property is located at the front, and here we have the rear garden area, all within the red line boundary. The number 39 in the terrace is a grade two listed building with an attached enclosed area of garden to the rear and lies within the Wokenham Town Centre Centre Conservation Area. Uh, this is the front elevation of the building, which contains a roof terrace above the existing garage, uh, which will be visible in upcoming slides. So here's the rear garden area. Um, the proposed development would, would result in a loss of an, of an early 20th century bridge and rockery. However, according to the heritage statement and the council's built heritage officer, these structures hold limited significance in themselves. Therefore, their removal are justified. Here's the proposed landscape plan. Um, the, pro the proposal seeks to remodel, refurbish and retain landscape fe features within the rear garden area, including a sunken pathway. Alterations within the listed building itself includes a new single storey rear extension, which would create a new bedroom here, and alterations to the existing kitchen and garden room above on the first floor, which is beside the existing terrace, roof terrace. Now, the occupier of the neighbouring property at number 41, the terrace, has raised concerns on the grounds that the proposal may cause a loss of light to their side windows and rear garden area of their property. However, as can be seen in this photo, which was taken from the rear garden area of the application site, any new extensions and landscaping features within the rear garden would be positioned well away from any habitable rooms or the rear patio area of the neighbouring property. Therefore, any loss of light or overshadowing concerns are minimal. Overall, subject to the conditions recommended by the Council's Built Heritage Officer and the Trees and Landscape Officer, the proposed development would not cause harm to the significance of the heritage asset or the conservation area and is acceptable on streetscape, neighbouring amenity, highways, drainage and trees and landscape grounds. As such, conditional approval is recommended. Thank you, Chair. Sorry? I beg your pardon. <laughs> OK, uh, the next speaker is uh, Im Councillor Imogen Shepherd dubay And because we're considering the two applications, uh, you have up to six minutes. Thank you. Hi there. I don't need six minutes. It's great. Um, <laughs> this application involves a listed building within the conservation area of Wokingham. It is the former home of William Martin, who was the mayor of Wokingham Town Council. As a leader of Wokingham Town Council, I do feel that we have uh, I have at least a temporary privilege of being a guardian of Wokingham and its heritage. I am also old enough to remember using Martin's pool. This outdoor pool area was built by William Martin using his own money and it included bridges, fountains, flower beds, rockeries ca and caves in a grotto. 
I'm also old enough to remember the public outrage that occurred when William Martin's pool was sold and demolished by Wokenham District Council. This application gives me some concern, not about the modifications to the house, but with the removal of the area called the Rockery. The Rockery was clearly constructed in the 1920s in William Martin's same style as Martin's pool. It was used uh, and it used to be regularly open for the public to visit. And I think that if it was still was, it would still have much more public interest. Looking at what has been written in the third party heritage report, it does not really acknowledge the full history of the site. While I understand that the current family who live here want to modernise their space and make it safer for their family to use, I cannot help feeling that Woking would be losing something of its heritage if this rockery was removed completely. I also see the Wokingham Society agrees with me and consider that the loss of this rockery would be a loss to Wokingham's heritage. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Imogen. Um, next, we have Paul Wham, uh, the applicant, and Kate Cooper, who will be speaking uh, for the application. And again, you have up to six minutes. Yeah. Is Kate on Teams? Yeah, that's good. Good. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Um, so I'm Paul Warren, the owner of the, the property. Um, we we bought the house because we, we love its history and we love the historical context. And we previously um, owned a listed building in, in Barkham. Um, but we did appreciate it was going to require significant um, investment to take it to the next stage of its um, evolution and to future proof it for the next generations of, um, of owners. Therefore, the de design brief was to preserve and blend with the significant historical features, whilst improving some of the functional aspects to be more in keeping with its current context and modern living. We've taken every step to do that in the correct way and followed due process. The architects and landscapes, landscapers that we've employed um, uh, have a lot of listing building um, experience. We've undertaken um, historical research and commissioned detailed heritage assessment. We've made pre-applications and have followed up on the, uh, the advice that's, um, that's been um, given. As part of the design and the investment, we wanted to restore the historical promenade, a prominent Italianate aspect of the garden, the cross pond and associated bricks works, brick works, and bring that design into a new terrace to replace the current rockery transition between the back of the house and that existing Italianate aspect. Um, key to that is using reclaimed bricks and replicating within the new terraced area wall and pillar design seen in the existing Italianate garden, <laughs> noting these also appeared in some of the brickworks associated with Martin's pool um, from um, historical photographs that we've, um, that we've got. It's also worth highlighting that the current circular design feature seen in the pond will also be represented in the, the lawn terrace design. Um, someone asked uh, as part of this process whether the new terracing would be lower maintenance than the rockery. That is not our expectation. Um, nor intention, but the garden as a whole does require a lot of maintenance. And it is in a smaller context than when originally designed, with no direct access from the back, which there was through through Martins, um, through the meadow and then the, um, the pool, nor from the side, um, which um, that access went with um, Martins estate, unfortunately. Um, so um, therefore, a kind of a functional aspect of the new design is to create more direct access, still through the garage, still through the house, but not via the utility space. This is to help ease that issue and to, to make access more, 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 more easy for the, for the garden's future um, maintenance, you know, appreciating the historical aspect there. Um, the other functional aspects of the design are to repair the porous roof and, and back wall to the utility, increased space in the kitchen area, modern living kitchen is an important room, and to create an occasional bedroom and study, obviously home working. Um, the house designs are of a modest scale and replace work completed in 1980s and 2000s, including a secondary spiral staircase of that later period. Um, there, was, uh, there was planning um, granted in the 80s for a ground floor bedroom annex, but that wasn't, uh, that wasn't developed. And that actually had a window overlooking the next door neighbor. Um, the, the other functional, um, um, sorry, the, lost my place, um, the design 
draws on original characteristics, um, turret landscape is, uh, landscaped steps, but also, but does so in a contemporary manner so that the narrative of the building is clear, which is in line with historic England's preference. To address some of the um, specific considerations in some of them, including some about the rockery, there was obviously concern about the history of the rockery. Look, it's difficult to determine what aspects of the rockery are original. Um, the rockery, unlike the Italianate aspects, do not feature in the historic plans. Um, the paths appear to have been augmented and expanded materially in the 80s um, per planning permission designs that we've seen. The water features within the rockery contain plastic piping within concrete um, and also have modding electrics. Uh, the bridge structure is reinforced concrete um, and I guess the important point there it is in disrepair so regardless of what happens here we're going to need to um, we're going to need to materially amend it to improve its safety to a, to a modern standard. Um, there was also some concern about the removal of protected trees. Um, we're, we're not doing out the big TPO oaks at the back of the garden um, will stay and remain untouched and a key feature. There are certain younger and poorer quality species of tree, laurel, holly, holly a damaged cherry tree, and uh, a, cip, a, a cypress tree, which is 20, 20 meters high, which has kind of outgrown its, um, uh, its landscaping will be removed. However, as part of the landscaping design, we intend to replace those with uh, a greater number of trees and also um, a number of oak species. Um, there was concern with regards to the removal of the staircase. Um, the staircase in the Victorian part of the house will not be touched. The staircase that will be removed is a steel staircase that was put in, in the 2000s. Um, Kate, did you want to add to that? You, I'm afraid you just have 30 seconds remaining, Kate. Yeah, I, I did have a lot to add. I, th I think Paul's covered that very well. But um, yeah, just to reiterate, really, this has been a really thorough and lengthy process that's been gone about, you know, in exactly the right way. And that some of these considerations are, are always difficult with what you retain. But I, I, I think really, you know, we have to look at this, this rockery as it exists in, in its present condition in, in a vastly altered context, which has no public access. And I think there is a recommendation to record it for posterity. But, uh, you know, the, the value of it in its current state and 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 you know the the requirement to retain that has, has not really uh, really been called into question by the planning officer so we, we'd look to uh, to council to 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 support their recommendation really thank you okay and the final speaker will be uh, councillor rachel bishop firth ward member Hello, good evening. Um, I want to say, first of all, that I'm not opposed to this development overall. Um, I understand the wishes of the family who live here to extend and to modernise their house and garden so it's easier to maintain. I am hoping, however, that we don't in the process of this unnecessarily remove the piece of Wokingham's history. The houses on the terrace are some of the most beautiful and distinctive in Wokingham. Um, and Councillor Imogen Shepherd Bay has just spoken about some of the history of number 39. The Working Society have also made some comments and I've taken them into account in my response. Uh, the Working Society have commented that the removal of the internal stair will affect the historic layout of this listed building. And both they and I would like to see uh, changes to the garden minimised. Uh, the bridges, rockery area and sunken pathways are uniquely designed and date back about 100 years. These are a real part of Wokingham's history and under all that is left of the unusual design which we used to have in the gardens of Martin's Pool before it was demolished. We would also like to see the trees retained wherever possible. If this planning application is allowed, I would therefore ask that the planning committee uh, retain as much of this unique garden as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, do any members have any questions or comments that they would like to make? Stephen. I just want to confirm, I, I think I understand this correctly, but there isn't any longer public access to the garden. So what we're considering here is an application by uh, a resident for the development of a private house and garden. The only really major consideration for us is is um, whether it, it in planning terms works uh, given the status of the building as a, as a listed building uh, and its location in the conservation area um, 
So I, I think it's important to recognise, although there are historic connections with this garden that are clearly are, are, are very important to a lot of people in Wokingham, um, the, the, the bridge and the rockery, um, if they were retained, nobody would see them anyway. I think that's quite an important point. They're not, they're not any longer a public asset in that sense. Thank you for that comment. Uh, Councillor Kaiser? Yes, yeah, so leading on from that, um, I, I'm afraid I don't understand about uh, heritage buildings. Do the gardens count as part of that heritage um, or is it, uh, is it separate? I mean, we wouldn't normally pass judgment on anybody's back garden. Uh, Tarek, can you answer that question, please? Uh, yes, I can confirm that the structures are cursage listed um, because they predate 1948. Okay, thank you. I've, I've lived in two grade two listed buildings in the past, and one in Wokingham Borough and one in Wilshire. And um, I've found in general that the uh, the work I've had to do to renovate them in conjunction with the conservation uh, officer in the various boroughs um, um, was very helpful and very positive. And I think um, the type of people who live in these properties are people who go in there with the very best of intentions. And listening to the, the occupants speak here and reading the officer's report, especially the conservation officer's remarks, so I'm, I'm confident that they, they plan to do the right thing. So I'm, I'm more than comfortable to support it without any ado further ado. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Stephen. Sorry, uh, Chair, to come back again, but just very briefly, I, I do think uh, that there seems to be broad agreement that the the the, uh, the, the re or rather the changes to the house are, are very sympathetically done. The only issue of contention seems to be the garden, as far as I can see, certainly f so far as Imogen is concerned. Um, and it does seem to me that what's being proposed uh, actually is in keeping. It does seem to preserve certain important features. Italianate style is 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 central to the whole new design. Uh, so I'm, I'm minded to approve both of these applications. If I could just make one comment or observation uh, with regards to concerns about the garden. I think we're talking about remodelling of the garden closest to the house. And I think it's important uh, to note that the council's built heritage officer doesn't have any objection to that. Besides their report, there's the very comprehensive, I think it's something like 55 page heritage statement that includes uh, reference to existing structures uh, in that part of the garden as quote, entirely unsuited to domestic, modern domestic garden. And that's in the, uh, the heritage statement. Um, is there anybody else who would like to ask any further comment, uh, questions yeah. or make any further comments? Thank you. Um, so we have to vote separately on two um, um, uh, items. Uh, agenda item 16 is application 220825. This is the planning application. Okay, this is the planning application. The second one which we're going to vote on is for the listed building consent. Okay, so uh, 220825, those in favour of approving this. Thank you. And 220826, which refers to the listed building consent, those in favour. Thank you very much. Could I propose we extend the meeting to allow the last application to be determined? Okay. We'd better take a vote on that. So all of those in favour, if necessary, um, uh, of going beyond 10.30 for half an hour. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>
Could I ask a question while we're just hanging about? Um, I can see it's a it's a, it's a Wokingham member of Wokingham, and it's a single story extension. Is it is it an application that would have been um, uh, uh, just? What's the what we're talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah permissive yeah. development. If it was somebody else. Okay, no, I'll just. No, no, the, right. the application is from the uh, staff of Walking Borough Council, and as it's a single story extension, my question was um, would it have been approved through permitted development if it was, say, a member of the public? Possible. Uh, well, Brian? Uh, no, but permitted development and being a member of staff at local authority has no bearing on permitted development rights. It's not so uh, this is. This is a planning application, and if it was permitted development, we would still have to consider it as the planning application in front of us at committee because it's member of staff. Okay, the next application is two double two one three double five two fifty one London Road, and there's. Tarek, would you like to give us a presentation? Yeah. There we go. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a household application for the proposed erection of a single story rear extension with two roof lights at 215 London Road. It should firstly be noted that the property is a detached two and a half story dwelling with dormer windows in the roof space, uh, not a semi detached dwelling as described in my officer report. The property is located along a separate access road, which is set back from London Road and is well screened by large trees and hedge, large trees, hedgerow and shrub, which is visible here. The proposed single story rear extension would have a flat roof, would extend the entire width of the dwelling and would extend 3.8 metres from the main rear wall of the, main rear wall of the dwelling. Uh, very limited views of the rear extension side elevation would be available from the gap between the host property um, and the neighbouring property. As the proposal is modest in height, depth and design, it would not adversely impact the character of the area or any neighbouring properties. To summarise, uh, the proposal involves the erection of a single storey rear extension. Uh, the proposed rear extension is modest in height, depth and design and is acceptable on streetscape and neighbour immunity ground. As such, conditional approval is recommended. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, the application is only before the committee because uh, the applicant is a member of staff. Uh, normally, an application of this kind would be dealt with as a delegated item with a planning officer making a decision uh, without it coming to the committee. Um, we can see very clearly what the officer recommendation is here. And I, I think there is absolutely no reason not to support that. So I will be doing so. John? Also, the fact there's no objection to it as well. Let's go to the vote then. Everybody in favour of this application? That's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, we can close the meeting now. There's no other business. Is there any other business?